to go ahead and stand for the Pledge of Allegiance, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, we have a Golden Apple Award, Dr. Bernia. All right, good evening, everyone. Jennifer Van Wagnon, come on up. Come on up to the least comfortable place in the room. Right there, that's perfect. Right, yep, right on the WL, and that way they can get you on the live stream. So you're being broadcast live online right now. My mom's watching. Tonight's first Golden Apple recipient is Jennifer Van Wagnon, principal at Meadowbrook Elementary. Jen was nominated by Heather Isers, a Meadowbrook parent, because she is impressed at how Jen jumped into her role as principal at MBE and acclimated so well. Heather shared, Ms. Van Wagnon is such a kind person and deserving of this recognition. Jen is devoted to her students through various interactions and acts of caring. She works with parents when she's concerned about a student's well-being, sets examples, and follows through. She seeks out ideas from other educators as well as parents and is motivated by her drive to have all children succeed and be supported. Dr. Lons, our deputy superintendent, enthusiastically supported Jen's nomination sharing. Ms. Van Wagnon has been a wonderful addition to the Wald Lake family. She is supportive, dedicated, and compassionate and cares deeply about her students, staff, parents, and the Meadowbrook School community. Not only is she an amazing leader at her school, but she is also a valuable resource to her colleagues. I look forward to working with her as she continues to lead her Meadowbrook Mustangs. Jen, thank you for all you do every day for students and families at Meadowbrook Elementary. It is our honor to recognize you this evening. Jen Van Wagner. I just want to take a moment to thank my family and my staff um, for being here this evening and for Nikolai and his mom for um, nominating me for this and for all the support from Dr. Lanz and the cabinet members. Uh, I wouldn't be standing here today if it weren't for those lovely people beh behind all of you. They make the world a brighter place. And so this is really their award. And I wanted to take an opportunity to share that with all of you. So thank you so much. Thank you. All right, and next we have an audit presentation. Dr. Bernia. Yes, thank you, Madam President. We have come to that point of year where uh, our third party audit has been completed by Plant Moran. And so I would like to welcome Plant Moran to the podium. They'll introduce themselves and then walk the board through their slides and their presentation about their findings. Uh, and, and from there, uh, just so the community is aware, we're gonna have a slight procedural change this year. So generally, in the, historically, we've had the presentation and the board has voted to accept the audit right on the same night this time we're going, based on board feedback, we're going to have the presentation and then the board will vote to accept the audit at our meeting on October 19th, which will give them a little bit of additional time to do some studying and ask questions and make sure that they feel comfortable. So with that, the floor is yours. Great, thank you very much. Um, my name's Donna Hansen. I'm the partner in charge of the audit. Um, with me tonight is Michael Walsh. He is the senior manager. Um, both of us have worked um, with uh, Wild Lake Schools for a few years now. Um, appreciate the opportunity to uh, be on your agenda tonight, and we're going to cover the results of the audit and some key highlights um, in a graph presentation. Um, the board should have received um, four items in the board package. Um, one is the basic financial statement, which is the big, thick document. Um, the federal programs or the single audit report, which details the grant dollars the district received. Um, the end of audit correspondence to the Board of Education, which includes several informational items for, for your reading pleasure, um, as well as this graph presentation. 
Um, we have completed our audit procedures, um, and the, the, um, you have received those final copies, um, and that's the audit reports. Let me make sure I... Here we go. Just to cover some key highlights from the audit, um, we have issued an unmodified opinion on the district's financial statements. An unmodified opinion is the highest form of assurance that we can provide that the district's statements are free of material misstatement and can be relied upon. Um, the financial statements are management's responsibility to prepare um, we have the responsibility to audit the financial statements and render an opinion on the financial statements, which is what that unmodified opinion is. Um, on the 2023 federal program audit results, um, we tested three major programs this year. Um, we test not only the dollars of those federal grants, but also compliance with all the rules and, and guide, guidelines that the district has to adhere to and how those dollars are spent. <coughs> um, we tested ch the Child Nutrition Cluster, Title I, and the ESSER funds. And there was about $6 million of that one-time funding um, that is in the district's financial statements. Um, we noted no um, compliance findings, no um, question costs in regards to those um, audits and those programs. We also just want to bring to your attention, there are included in the revenue of the district some non-recurring funding sources of revenue. As I mentioned, um, the COVID dollars, um, those are dollars that um, needed to be spent, so those grant programs, um, call them ESF funds, ESSER funds, and those dollars are winding down now and all have to be spent by September 2024. And also included in the financial statements is one-time funding, an additional payment for the pension plan for the MIPSERS program. Those are dollars that come in to the district and go out directly into uh, the pension plan, the MIPSERS program. That was approximately $8.3 million, which kind of grosses up your financial statement. So there's 8.3 in revenue, and then it's 8.3 in the expenditure side as well. We also test as part of the audit, the bond and sinking fund compliance. So your bond programs, um, not only just the dollars that are spent, but also that the, the proper bidding and, and the allowable costs under the ballot language and um, in compliance with the guidelines for bonds and sinking funds. We had no issues with regards to that. Something we do take a note of um, as we're auditing is assessing uh, the budget process at the district. Um, the Uniform Budget Act um, by law, um, the Board of Education adopts the budget and the administration has to work and not overspend that budget. Um, we saw, found that the district continues to have good budget processes and procedures in place, and there was no um, overspending of the budget this year. And finally, just want to congratulate the district on, again, earning the ASBO Certificate of Excellence in Financial Reporting for 2022. This is a certificate that you'll find in the financial statements um, for last year's audit report. Um, and it just speaks to the quality of the district's financial reporting, um, as well as you can see, there's a much more comprehensive information in the district's financial statement. I'm gonna turn it over to Michael, and he's gonna cover the highlights of uh, not only the general fund, but uh, the balance sheet of all the major funds of the district. Thanks, Donna. <laughs> Um, so the, to kind of kick things off from a, a numbers perspective, I um, wanted to just give you know, the balance sheet of the district at June 30, 2023, really just an overview of, of the governmental funds of the district. Um, so really moving left to right there, um, we see the, the first, the, the, our major program. So for the district, the, the general fund being the main operating fund of the district, um, you see that on, on, on the left-hand side there. Um, we'll talk about a lot more about the you know, revenue expenditures um, and that ending fund balance of the major fund of 22.2 million on uh, some later slides here. Um, the next two major programs are both capital projects funds, um, the 2022 bond issue fund, and then the 20 or the 2020 bond issue fund, and then the 2022 bond issue fund. Um, for the 2022 bond issue fund, there was about spending on, on uh, capital related expenditures of about 62 million dollars. 
um, bringing that ending fund balance to 65.3 million. Um, the 2022 bond issue fund, um, with the focus of spending down the 2020 bond issue fund, um, relatively consistent in terms, not a ton of spending in that fund. Um, so fund balance uh, coming in at $64 million. Um, the final column over there, the non-major governmental funds, um, that um, consists of the, the district special revenue funds, um, the debt service funds, um, as well as the sinking fund. So the, moving into the general fund um, specifically, this first slide is meant to highlight the, the general fund revenue sources um, for, for the year ended June 30, 2023, and then also for comparative purposes, we have the 2022 uh, year over there on the right. Um, for the year ended June 30, 2023, the district had $186 million of general fund revenue. Um, one real quick comment here on if you're looking at it from a comparative perspective, and, and Donna mentioned this, um, there's that 147C2 dollars that the, the district received. So that, that's uh, $8.3 million to fund those retirement costs. That's unique to 2023, so you're gonna see your revenue and your expenditures inflated by the $8.3 million if you're looking at it from a year-over-year -year perspective. Um, focusing specifically on, the, on 2023 and, and that pie chart there, um, you see the largest component is, is the state portion of the foundation allowance coming in at 42% of, of total revenue. Um, we'll talk a lot more about that on, on some later slides here. That's really driven by um, you know, the district's enrollment as well as the foundation allowance set by the state. So we'll get some historical information um, there on, on some later slides. Um, there's other state and local revenue makes up about 33%. Uh, that includes those uh, retirement funds uh, that comes in from the state. So in, in total, uh, about $24 million this year for, for the existing 147C1 money that you had re would have received last year and then the, that $8.3 million that was new this year. Um, property tax, the, that orange bucket comes in at, at 17% um, and then federal funding at about 8% and that, that the federal funding would be subject to our, our single audit and um, as Donna mentioned, there's about $6 million in that, in that pool of those uh, non-recurring ESF funds. So the, the next two slides are now looking at general fund expenditures. Um, so general fund expenditures for the year for the district came in at $181.8 million. Um, this first graph shows it by object, so kind of really showing where, the, where these dollars are being spent. Um, for, you know, first school district being run by people, you'd expect to see a significant portion of that going to salaries and employee benefits. Um, and, and for 2023, you see that at 81% going to, to um, um, salaries and employee benefits for employees of the district. Um, and, and that, again, would include uh, some of those 147C dollars from an expenditure standpoint. Um, related, to, uh, you also see purchase services coming in at about 13%, so that would be um, you know, contracted workers that the district has, I think um, subs, bus drivers, things of that nature. <laughs> um, and then you, you also see supplies and, and some other expenses rounding out the, the, the rest of the, the pie chart there. So the, the next graph here shows that same expenditure pool and just um, breaks it out by function as, as defined by the, by the state. And that's really looking at it more of like an activity or department level view. Um, you know, from a comparison perspective, you know, bigger pool again of, of expenditures for some of the things we talked about, but overall the percentages by, by department or by function are very consistent year over year. Um, we see, you know, the largest piece of that coming in at 78% indirect, indirect instruction, um, really with the focus keeping, you know, those resources um, in, in, you know, in the classroom and um, indirect being, um, you know, counselors, librarians, things of that, that nature. So combined, you're, you're looking at about 78% of, of total expenditures um, in that pool. Um, and then, the, you know, the rest, uh, the, the rest of those buckets um, all coming in, you know, between, you know, a couple percentage points. So the, the next few slides, as I, as I mentioned, we, with the you know the districts, the, the largest funding source um, coming from the state, we wanted to talk about the the foundation allowance and and you know with the two drivers being enrollment, um, as well as what the foundation allowance set by the state of Michigan is. Um, so this first slide is really uh, meant to show the, the trend in enrollment um, for the district over the last ten years, and um, overall you see that we see this trend um, is pretty consistent across the state of Michigan. Um, decline, you know, a lot of districts dealing with declining enrollment for a variety of factors. Um, you know, some being just, you know, a lot of families, there's less, less kids um, in, a, in a family environment. Um, there's competition from private, online, coming out of the pandemic, um, um, different private schools, things like that. So 
Um, we, you know, we certainly see this trend um, at, at a lot of our, our at a lot of our local districts. So overall, over the, that ten-year period there, you see the district um, at a loss of about 2,800 students. Um, so we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that on, on the next slide in terms of what that means from a funding perspective. Um, I do want to comment um, specifically on you, you see the the asterisk there for 2020-2021. Um, and then you, you see the drop in the following year in 21, 22. And um, that I wanted to, we wanted to point that out specifically that there was, um, the state came up with a mechanism coming out of the pandemic, knowing that <coughs> enrollment figures would likely drop um, to allow you to um, use um, some of your enrollment or, or per pupil figures from pre pandemic to, to kind of lessen that drop in that year. Um, with that, though, you then see the following school year, once the super blend formula went away. Um, you see a larger drop in, in enrollment. So that's really, the way I view that is that's really two years um, in, in that year for that's shown on this graph. Um, so I'm gonna pass it back to Donna to kind of talk about what, you know, what that enrollment means from a, from a funding perspective. Thank you, Michael. We always like looking back at um, a bit of history um, when comparing <laughs> financials. Um, and this graph is very telling in what the district has been working through for the past several years. Um, the, the red portion here is the student population, which Michael just mentioned. And then the blue portion is the per pupil foundation allowance. So you can see that's been relatively flat over time. The far, first column there, the first line, is actually from 2008 and 2009. So at that time, the district had 15,711 students and the foundation was $8,635 per pupil, um, which amounted to around um, $135.7 million of revenue. Compare that to where um, the district is today. At, in 2022-23 year, um, it, the per pupil foundation was $9,195 per pupil with 12,210 students. So over that period of time, and we, we always use this 2009 year as the mark because that's when funding cuts started. So that per pupil foundation <coughs> allowance was cut. Um, so you know the last few years there's been increases in that foundation. At that time there were cuts, significant cuts. In addition, you know, Wald Lake is a hold harmless district, which means some of that foundation is made up of um, property taxes. And there was a, a, a 20J uh, component to that, which capped um, you know, how much um, impact inflation affected the district. And that cap went away, um, or that 20J funding went away, which was also very impactful to the district's revenue. And so what has happened since that time and the mechanism that the state incorporated for several years, which was the two times funding mechanism, is the lowest funded districts um, had bigger increases in funding. Um, and of course, the higher funded districts had more per pupil. Um, Wall Lake was what we called like one of those middle districts that got <laughs> kind of squeezed in the middle. So over time, as the district was losing per pupil, number of pupils, you were also not increasing, um, the foundation allowance was not increasing over that time. And so the district was being squeezed, essentially, and so and essentially shrinking over that period of time. Mm -hmm. It was very difficult to manage through um, managing your cost structure. I recall all the work that the district do did during that period. And it's quite telling in the sense that if you look at where your per pupil foundation is now, $9,195, that's only $560 more per pupil than you received back in 2000. Nine. So over that period of time, it's pretty, pretty, pretty stark in, in how little the, the funding has been. And $450 or $450 of that just came in the last year. So, um, you know, I've always given this district a significant amount of credit for the amount of work that has been done to live within the revenue dollars that you, re you receive um, and for all that you do with those dollars. And in comparison, we just wanted to show you some other um, Oakland County districts. Um, when Proposal A went into effect, um, there was a great disparity between the lowest funded district and the highest funded district. 
districts. And over time, um, those lowest funded districts were, um, their funding was increased. There was big increases, not big, I would say, uh, larger increases in those districts per pupil funding, um, bringing up those bottom districts to um, at a greater speed than the middle funded districts. And now as a result, um, you know, Wald Lake was more of a middle funded district and now you are all about second um, lowest funded um, in, in the county. And finally, just a graphic of where the fund balance as a percentage of total expenditure stands um, as, the, as of the end of 2023. Um, this is a, a measure that districts compare themselves with um, and also the state monitors. So the statewide average is, uh, is depicted in that light teal uh, shade there at the bottom in comparison with where Wald Lake's fund balance as a percentage of expenditures is. Um, in 2022, the average um, at, at the state, and they exclude Detroit Public Schools from this calculation, is around 20.3%. Um, um, we did see a ticking up um, of district's fund balance as a result of the COVID, the COVID grants that were coming through. Um, Wald Lake was at 10.5%, um, which was roughly half that amount, um, and then moved up to 12.2% when some more of those grant dollars were being realized in 2023. Um, this just speaks to uh, like uh, at the fact that at about 12.2%, that's around six weeks of operation resources that the district has in fund balance currently. Okay. Just to recap, positive audit results. Um, we know the business office um, goes through a great deal in preparing for the audit. Um, being audited isn't fun. Um, it's in addition to the day-to-day -day, uh, work that the district is uh, doing each day. Um, I wanna acknowledge um, Vicki Amore. Um, she's our point person at the district um, in preparing the financial statements. Um, and uh, Terry Les, who is no longer here, she was here through July, I believe, in, in assisting and closing the books um, this year as well. Um, but we appreciate the, the diligent work and uh, the processes and controls the district has in place um, are positive. I'm happy to entertain any questions. Yep, anybody have anything tonight? Mr. Siegel? Just a little recap so the audience has a little bit of a better understanding. We lost 20J in 2011, I believe, mm -hmm. and that was roughly $4.3 million a year at, at that time, close, uh, that, we were, that we never recovered. Uh, we are more of a 1X district when it comes to the multipliers coming from the state than uh, some, of, some of our neighbors, which are 2X districts. When you look at that fund balance, we went through a period uh, that fund balance was as low, I believe, as about a 5.8 or 5.9 at one point mm -hmm. in time. And we've made great strides to increase it. And a little history on, on, our, on the budget and what we've done. We used to have a book that had our budget items in it that was probably about three to four inches thick. And when we started to do cuts, and Mrs. Casagrande will remember, and several of my board colleagues that were here earlier would, will remember, it was like a menu. What, okay, we're gonna take this from this column, this from this column, and this from this column, and we can get through this year. And it proceeded to go from about a three to four inch binder to a single piece of paper, one-sided. And we've been fortunate to maintain a fair amount of programs. We've been fortunate in the last few years to bring back several programs that we had to uh, put, put aside. Uh, I have to give kudos to our, uh, to all of our administrators and our administration in this district for doing the job that they've done because had it not been for their foresight and their diligence in doing this, we would be in far worse shape than we are in this day and age. So I just wanted to give a little, give a little history on that. Sure, yes, Mrs. Levin. So one thing I noticed while I was 
while we're reviewing the presentation, you know, it's $186 million budget. That's a, a big number. And we break it down, you know, there's the foundation allowance, there's property taxes it's mm -hmm. from the state, but in reality, every dollar that the state gives is really our money. So um, $186 million came from all of you. So thank you for all supporting um, the school district. And, you know, I, I speak for myself and hopefully for other board members when I say that we really try to do the best with the dollars that we are given by any entity um, to, to really spend it the best and, and make as, as good a decisions as we can with the votes that we make. So um, just want to you know, recognize the support of the community because that money doesn't just come from the state, it comes from us. So thank you. Mr. Peterson. Uh, one question. Can you give me an idea in a simplistic way, uh, maybe the 2,500 foot level? <laughs> when you do your audit, how, what do you and how deep do you dig? into each of these categories. And I get, I don't wanna like, just an overview. No, I, I appreciate that Thank question. You. <laughs> um, so it just is, it's a good opportunity to remind everyone that this is an audit of the financial statements of a district. There's different types of audits. There's forensic audits, which look for fraud. There's an internal control audits that just specifically look at internal controls of entities. Um, this is a financial statement audit. And so we look at the functions that the district has. So payroll is a very big function. Um, revenue coming in is a very big function. And we, we assess the risk. Where are the risky areas? And we do this in, in several different ways. Um, we understand and assess the internal controls and processes. We don't audit them, um, but that is kind of the support for how we design the audit procedures. Um, and then we test in detail um, those different areas that have higher risk um, from, you know, from an audit perspective. So we drill down deeper, test more detailed testing in the riskier areas of the district. Thank you. Yeah. Any other comments or questions? Thank you. We appreciate you coming tonight. Thank you for having we'll us. We'll see you on the 19th. And before we move on, I just want to thank the business office, the business team, uh, Mrs. Amore and, and her team and, and the work that they've done to get prepared for the audit, but also this is, this is the compilation of a year's worth of work. And so this is, a very nice, uh, this is a very nice tribute to how hard they work and what, good, what a good job they do for us. Um, and then selfishly speaking, I, I called my mentor to tell him we had received, I had received as superintendent my first unmodified audit and he said he had just received his 17th. So I got a long way to go. Thank you. All right. All right, are there any more cards? Because we're gonna start public commentary and then we're not gonna take any more cards. I've had a lot of feedback from people and people are saying we really want you to follow the rules that you set. So we're gonna try. I'm gonna try really hard to do that. Um, Mrs. Lovett is going to time for us and she is going to let you know if you do get close to three minutes. Everybody has up to three minutes. You don't have to take three minutes, but if you want to, you can. Uh, when you come to speak at the podium, I will try very hard to get your name correct. If not, you will help me along. And the podium is right over here. And uh, somebody asked me um, this week and asked the board to you know, talk about personal attacks. And I thought, well, there's a lot of ways I could do that. Um, you know, we're all adults here. I think we know what a personal attack is and what it isn't. And I would really um, appreciate and the board would really appreciate um, if, if we could have respectful conversation and here. And we will not have a discussion with you. We will listen to you. And also know that um, it, it's a gray area. And, and we also have to allow you to speak because it's public commentary. So I. Tr I try really hard not to judge that too much. I try to give you a little leeway, but we're all here for the same mission, for kids, for the district. So again, it, I would just ask that we um, listen respectfully to each other and allow you to have your time to speak tonight. All right, our first person is Megan Young. Hi, um, I'm coming tonight because I was coming for the food service 
kind of questionnaire. Um, so we just moved here about a year and a half ago and we love the schools and we love everything about Wald Lake. But I just wanted to, I was very surprised, sorry, I'm very nervous. <laughs> but it's okay. I was very surprised when I found out about the lunches that were being served in for the elementary schools. Um, I found out that I, I think, okay, so I work in a different district and I am a lunch lady, but so I was trying to figure out, you know, parents are not allowed in schools anymore, so I can't see what my child, child is being served. So every day she comes home and I would just like her to be able to get a lunch every once in a while, but she will not eat the food and I couldn't figure out why. So after talking to a couple people, we have figured out that it's basically because everything is being shipped from a base kitchen to the elementary school, so everything is in warmers. And so um, I, I just don't understand, so everything's in warmers, so nothing's actually like cooked or fresh, everything's in bags. Um, I, I guess um, I, I, I guess I would invite everybody to go to one of the elementary school lunchrooms and maybe try a lunch, um, the first lunch and the last lunch, so you could see what it's like for the kids that sat there for three hours and had the last lunch from the warmers. Um, sorry. Um, um, okay, so and I also know that maybe it's a staffing issue. So let's just say this because there's only one lunch lady in all the elementary schools, which is probably pretty unheard of. Everybody usually has two. You have one that would run a line, one that would sell snacks, and then you'd have someone that made the food in the kitchen. So also, we the situation was that Dublin is that they're not being sold snacks because there's not enough staff. Um, but you run on a skeleton staff at all times. So I just don't understand because this I know from. I know there has to be some kind of budgetary where you could probably have a two staff in elementary schools at all at all times, even in COVID, not COVID. Um, I know the numbers. Um, I I just I just want them because we're all here for the kids, and we all we 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 just want them to eat. And if the numbers are there, it's great. But what what's the numbers mean if everything's going in the garbage and they're not eating? You know, you want them to come home. There's some kids that never. I know different levels of situations over here, but there's some seconds. kids that don't get meals unless it's here. And it's, you know, breakfast and lunch. And so if they're not eating it, I mean, those, those are their only meals and they're, they're, they're coming to us. And so we want to serve them the best that we can, you know? So I just wanted to put it out there that if you do have a warmer in there, you could roll it out and put in a um, oven, just say. But that's it. And, and, and I know everybody does their best and everybody's here for the kids. And I don't mean any disrespect at all. Thank you. Tim Smith. Good evening, board. Thank you for the opportunity to speak here tonight. Um, my concern is also with uh, the lunch programs, but for slightly different reasons. Um, at the last board meeting, several folks shared their excitement over the expansion of the free lunch programs to all students, but I just wanted to identify with every action, there are unintended consequences. Um, one of the first un unintended consequences is that, um, that the food services group was already understaffed. They had open requisitions for uh, employees that they were unable to fill with the existing program. And the, the issue is tends to be that um, they have constraints that govern who, who's, who's likely to be somebody that would be interested in the opportunity. The opportunity only allows somebody to work 3.75 hours a day so that it essentially is 20, less than 20 hours a week, which if they break the 20 hour threshold, then dental and vision benefits are, are, are required for those employees. And I'm, I'm getting my, my information from a friend that actually works in the Wild Lake School food, food Service Activity. And so these are just some of the, the, the things that, that she has shared with us. Um, the hourly rates are proving to be uncompetitive and somebody that will only work less than four hours a day is obviously somebody that's a non-working parent that has a child in school and then they can, they can come to school and work while their child's in school. But, there's not a lot of people that are out there that are interested in these jobs or taking these jobs. So before the expansion of the program, they were already understaffed. So 
one of the things is, um, you know, that the, the food program with the expansion of the, the free lunches to all students went from a needs-based program to one that's a needs-based program with the addition of convenience. And I think there, that I have a couple of different concerns about that aspect of it because the already understaffed resources are now required to deliver twice the amount of food at, at every, every meal. And there's a lot of students in the school that are not even aware that the breakfast is free also for them. So once seconds. they do, then these people are just, they're absolutely swamped. So it's like there's just not enough people to manage the food. So it sounds like a great idea to offer free, free lunches to everybody, but it's with the constraint of an understaffed uh, group and also with um, them needing to deliver twice as many lunches in the same, same time period as they normally would. So no problems whatsoever with the, with the need-based lunch program. The, the understanding would be that Time. everybody would be, um, that needed a lunch would get a lunch. And, um, but when people, with uh, people that are capable of paying for their student lunch, it just seems like an un unnecessary aspect of adding free lunches for people that are clearly capable of paying for lunch for their kids or making their kid a lunch and sending them to school. So. Um, my final uh, consequence of this is, is why should the taxpayer be funding these free lunches to families that are fully capable? And, you know, what we really want to do is we really want our, our students to, um, you know, when, the, when our students take anything that's free, they have, to, <clears throat> they have to understand that somebody is paying for that. And in this case, when the government is issuing it, that's taxpayer money. And, it build, I think it builds a dependency Sir, on Sorry, you people. hit your three minutes, just so you know. Okay. If you could just finish up, we'd appreciate it. Okay, yeah. It, and when they get stuff for free, then they, it develops an expectation in them that they can look for their, their care to come from the government. I think we wish to develop self-reliant young people that are knowledgeable and capable of taking care of themselves. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Kathy Cubitt. After attending many uh, board meetings, and it used to be there were four people in the audience and you'd only have to call on a few to talk. But um, I would like to bring to attention to the order of comments in which Ms. Casagrande calls on the attendees interested in getting up to speak at our school board meetings. I've observed there seems to be a prejudice against certain members of the community and favoritism to others that always place certain people at certain times in the commenting lineup. For example, I have noticed despite what other order people arrive and submit their cards, Ms. Casagrande is shuffling the cards into some particular order. I think this violates the equitable treatment of Wall Lake uh, school citizens. I would like to call upon Ms. Uh, Ms. Casagrande or the board um, to allow those who choose to comment to write a ne the next number uh, in numerical sequencing on their card when they hand them in and to call the speakers to the podium in the set sequence of card submission. I don't know if that's possible because I just saw how people come up at the last minute, but I'm just observing. And then all att attendees will be assured of being treated the same. Thank you, I know you try your best, but I think that what I have observed is that uh, certain people are first and then others are last. Maybe it's the way they hold off their cards, but I want it to be looked at. Thank you so much. Tracy Walker. Hello. I'm here to speak on a change that I've seen with the Wald Lake Schools. The Wald Lake School Board meetings have seemingly become a forum for people to come at the behest of a few outside organizations. This, quote, sneak attack, as it was called in a recent YouTube video, was done purposely to cause disruption to the broader needs of the district. To begin, let me remind you of your own board policy in regard to how you serve our school community. Section 1001, duties and responsibilities of board members. Board members are elected to serve the interests of the school district and the entire school community. These interests are not to be subordinated to any partisan principles, group, or interest. 
the code of ethics that you that say you will promote the best interest of the school district as a whole and will adhere to these ethical standards and principles. Number nine states, I will respectfully listen to those who communicate with the board, seeking to understand their views while recognizing my responsibility to represent the interests of the entire school community. And to be fair to all the board members and to prevent showing bias to only a few as we get started, a few a quick internet search of all board members did not return any results with this same rhetoric I will mention today. As a matter of fact, it took much more time to determine if they had political bias at all. Back to the oath. As recently as June 14th of this year at a meeting of a politically motivated group, one of the elected board members on this board stood up and said, in regard to those with those different views or interests that are noted in the oath that the quote, other side will not back down and would be very good at organizing and getting people to come out, unquote. This was followed by a statement in reference to the 2024 open seats that this political group, quote, really needs to fill those with some strong conservatives, unquote. My question is, if you are serving the whole district and following your oath, what, quote, side are you referring to? And why are you voicing a need to back candidates from a specific political party for a supposedly nonpartisan position? At another meeting with members of this board present, the statement was made that this group planned to, quote, use Walled Lake as a guinea pig, unquote, for pushing very politically agenda-based items. Again, if board members are holding to the oath they took, what exactly is our district being used for and why are they there? I am tired of our school district being a pawn in someone's political game. If board members want to have a place to voice seconds. their personal or political views, please resign and go run for political office. These statements and actions are towing a very thin line of breaching the oath of office that this board agreed to uphold. <laughs> Teresa Renaud. <laughs> Teresa, yeah, thank you. Good evening. Uh, I have three things to say this evening. First of all, thank you, uh, Mr. Russo, for your follow-up with me last week, or last month, I mean. With regard to our bathroom policy, which is complicated, I get it, I, uh, it's all around the Title IX stuff, and actually, I think it was yesterday, national news broke that a Pennsylvania school district has uh, reversed their bathroom policy and will now take on, I'm sure, gazillion dollars of legal lawsuits, or legal lawsuits, um, to fight that challenge. So, I respect uh, the situation that you guys are in. It's a hard one, it's a cultural one, we're gonna have to, really, uh, as, a, as a community, figure out what it is that we want. So I've been doing a little bit of research and I've also been doing a little bit of thinking. As I look back on why Title IX was actually implemented, it was to give equality, uh, mostly um, financially, for girls to be able to compete in sports. Title IX did not say, we're gonna send girls over to the boys' sports and we're gonna force boys to play with girls. So I don't understand why we're forcing girls to have to go to the bathroom with boys. I don't know where the common sense is in that. I don't know where the legality is in that, but that's not me, I'm not an attorney. And um, I'm just, just wanted to put out an opinion. But I appreciate what you said. It's complicated, I get it. I did wanna read a um, Michigan law, uh, MCL 380, because we do have a little bit of conflict there. My ultimate question, and then I'll stop, is how much Title IX funding does the school district get? Because that's what it is at risk. The lawsuits and the lack of funding will impact us. So if our federal governments decide that boys can go in girls' bathrooms and we don't have to have separate bathrooms, we will lose funding and potentially get sued. So if we could understand how much Title IX funding we get, then perhaps the community as a whole could give you input on whether or not they'd like to subsidize, whether or not we should you know, make separate bathrooms. But in addition to that, we do have a Michigan law, MCL 380, which does state, it is the natural fundamental right of parents and legal guardians to determine and direct the care, teaching, and education of their children. The public schools of the state serve the needs of the pupils by cooperating with the pupils' parents and legal guardians to develop the pupils' intellectual capabilities and vocational skills in a safe and positive environment. So that's my, my question tonight. How much funding do we get from t Title IX? I appreciate the feedback. 
Christy Rust. Uh, good evening. I just, I know it's school safety week coming up or whatever. It should be all the time. Um, and I just wanted to voice my concerns, opinion again with how the district is um, viewing what school safety is all about. I know we've had many, many people come up here and talk about wanting to have some type of security guard, a retired police officer, something like that. Um, I've been up here before to tell you I work in Brighton schools and um, our security guard at the elementary school, he's in plain clothes. The kids know he's there to keep us safe. Not only is he there to keep us safe, um, you know, from the outside world, whatever it is, he's also there as another role model for children, another safe adult that they can talk to. Um, he, I, I talked to him just the other day, and I was like, how many times do you circle this building to see that the doors, you know, my classroom door, I see him walk by it a handful of times a day. Sometimes when I leave, it doesn't necessarily already click all the way shut. So I'll, if I don't hear it, I go back, but not everyone notices. He goes around the building multiple times a day. He is a huge impact for these children's mental health as well. We've got, um, we did some PD at the beginning of the year and we all wrote postcards to ourselves as kind of a check-in, like, hey, are you remembering to use this and that? So there are some students that we have that have needs, things like that. And one of the things that he is doing <coughs> to make connections with students is He's going around delivering these postcards to the teachers. So now this student who needs more positive role models is with the security guard who's delivering things. So in addition to keeping us safe, checking in the volunteers, making sure kids go to the right people, um, he's also building positive relationships with the students, which in turn will hopefully you know, make them all feel safe at school, ha have a positive um, figure, adult figure in the school. And so I really hope that um, Wald Lake is seriously gonna find some money to put people like that in their buildings. And if you don't know how to get the money, you know what, call Brighton. They're doing it, I know it's a smaller district, but it's at the end of the day, they have less pupils, so they probably have less money, and we have more pupils, and, and I think that it would really um, put a lot of us at ease if you could you know, figure out how other people are doing that, how other schools are doing it, and how we can do that as well. Thank you. I have Melissa, I think it's Melissa Paul, because I think I'm getting to know your writing a little bit. Am I right? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Hello on this rainy night. When our son was a, a student in the district, I was in one of his office school offices one day and inquired what kind of security the district provided them at that school, which, by the way, had more than 1,000 students, teachers, and personnel there every day. They said, we've got electric, electronic screens that show what's going on in various parts of the building, and we have doors that automatically lock, and it's the same today. So first, let's talk about the electronic screens that are picking up what goes on in the school. I then asked, is there someone who is monitoring those screens? Someone to notice if something is amiss or to notice if someone's in the building who shouldn't be there. And they said, no, there is not. No one has the job of monitoring those screens. So I ask you, if you haven't given all of our schools a security card to monitor those screens, then what's the point of having real-time electronic screens that are in essence showing no one what's going on. And let's talk about the automatically locking doors. It's been my experience, and I bet most parents' experience, that those of us who've ever set foot in our child's school know how easy it is to catch a door behind someone going in or have a door held open for you. So I ask again, if you haven't given all of our schools a security guard to be at the main door to monitor who's going in and out, then what's the point of having automatically locking doors that aren't able to keep a person with ill intent out? I know the idea of metal detectors without a security guard has been an idea I've heard batted around. If this is what you're thinking, I would remind you that anywhere you go through a metal detector, TSA, a courthouse, wherever, there is 
logically a competent armed security guard who's capable of stopping an armed perpetrator from entering and causing death and destruction. I have yet to hear a cogent, compelling, or convincing reason why our district does not have on-site security personnel for all its schools. Please don't say it's about the money because you have been sitting on for a while now a $1.4 million grant to be used specifically for school safety and security. And please don't say you won't spend grant funds which will run out on salaries for security guards because this district has used ESSER grant money which is also limited for salaries in recent years. In today's day and age, having this kind of school security is something that potential district families desire. They look at this kind of thing before moving into a district. So if you want to encourage enrollment, which is one of your goals to be sure, this would be a crucial thing to look at as it is very important to parents. I'm asking for each board member to please, please state where you stand on this issue. Time. The parents and teachers of the district deserve to know. Please help us understand why you as a whole appear to prioritize armed security for yourselves, case in point, the competent officer is standing at the door right now, but why not do the same for all the children and teachers of the district? Thank you. Sandy Douse. Thank you. One nation under God, we said tonight. God sees everything, but so parents and taxpayers can see transparently. Isn't it time that the school district work to reinstill confidence in our public schools by installing video equipment in our classrooms? Purchases noted by the agenda in 9A being made with school safety grants, about almost a quarter of a million dollars, should include video cameras. And I didn't even know about the previous speaker mentioning the $1.4 million grant. What parent wouldn't feel more confident in their school if they could tune in occasionally and see how their child is actually an interacting in their classroom and learn about the material their child is learning? The presence of security cameras provides greater peace of mind to parents and is a much better experience when issues do arise. It demonstrates that the school administration takes the interest of parents in their children's education seriously and prioritizes student well-being and general parental concerns. This should be an issue that both sides of the divide could agree on for everyone's protection. Security cameras also allow administrators to resolve incidents more quickly and give parents prompt and satisfying answers. COVID school closures cause students to stay home and learn virtually, giving parents the opportunity to see the materials our schools were teaching children. It was what initiated the questions many parents have surrounding the curriculums being used in taxpayer-funded public education. Parents now are questioning what criteria is being used to select material that seems to integrate certain ideologies that may be contrary to the values they are teaching to their own children in their home. In the post-COVID era, some parents have lost trust in their children's educators or curriculum. What can be done to reinstill that trust? Because without trust, we will continue to have contentious school board meetings across school districts. The answer might lie in what tools other professions are employing to protect vulnerable people in situations where there are others in authority over them. Nursing homes, daycare centers, babysitters, police patrol cars, all have something in common. They are monitored by video cameras to ensure the safety of those who may be unable to protect themselves. Vulnerable elderly residents in nursing homes are now much safer from the possibility of abusive workers. Live video when used in daycare centers gives parents peace of mind that their child is happy and well cared for. Surveillance cameras have been used seconds. for years now in the protection of citizens from aggressive police officers and often are shown to protect those same officers themselves from false accusations by the people they encounter in their line of duty. In some instances, students can threaten teachers and vice versa. Um, a friend of mine had a situation in Wild Lake High School where her son was in the ninth grade and she would have liked to have a video to see what actually took place between the teacher and her son. 
Harassment can be highly detrimental to a child's well-being and academic development, Time. while false accusations damage a teacher's career and reputation. Having security cameras installed in classrooms provides some objective truth when any number of allegations can occur. If an incident happens, video footage can provide leadership with accurate information to act on. Nothing's more important to parents than their child's safety and well-being. Video cameras in schools would be a powerful tool that to ensure that parents regain trust in public institutions again. Safety issues should be a top priority for this board. You cannot buy trust with dollars, You've hit but your time, you can please. buy cameras. Trust, but verify. Thank you. Lisa West. Good evening. Um, so I have a couple of things I want to talk about tonight. One is I know parent-teacher conferences are coming up, and something I had mentioned last year, um, we had done it online last year, but I'd really like to see that we have the opportunity to both go, maybe go back in person or have a choice for virtual. Many families I know do well in virtual, but it's not necessarily perfect, a perfect system as sometimes you have glitching with the internet, people are talking over each other, so I'd like to see an opportunity for in-person as well. Um, in regards to the safety and security grant that we have, I appreciate that you guys are considering purchasing the blackout shades. However, that's still not a re full replacement to make sure that all doors are secure. If our doors aren't secure, our students and our staff are not safe. So we need to make sure that doors are secure. Um, we, with a 1.4 million grant, we also need to make sure that other security measures are met. From what I understand, um, many buildings, I don't know of all of them, but don't necessarily have fire ladders. So if there's a fire, our students and staff on the second floor have no necessarily a safe way out. So we should see some about some of those things, um, as well as cameras for deliveries to see who's on the other side of a door, if it's a solid door. Um, and then finally, there's the Lucy, Lucy Calkins second grade work, writing workshop, and Mrs. Kohansky, I appreciate you getting back to me. However, um, I am very concerned that there was an introduction in Teacher's Guide, and I understand that when this curriculum was adopted, that you're not gonna go through each page um, to see what is in it, and that it's up to each teacher's discretion to decide of whether you're going to implement that particular lesson for the day. However, when they start talking about sexualizing children to second graders, kids who are between six and eight years old, there is no room for that, whether it's heterosexuality or homosexuality. And to include little Nas X, who I find demonic personally, when I hear about blood and shoes, I don't see any reason for that to be brought into my child's classroom. And I understand that they're not bringing that particular aspect in, but I don't see any reason to have that even included in any type of curriculum. And I would like to know how the district plans on going ahead and making sure that this particular lesson or any other lesson that might relate in any other type of way is not included within the classroom. So um, we have young, line, young children here. Um, they deserve to have their innocence preserved. Um, and I'd like to see that we continue to preserve their innocence. Um, our our, we have our motto of every child every day, let's preserve their, them being children. Thank you. Michelle Fister. Hello. Freedom. We all want to be free and be able to live free. In scriptures, it talks about if the sun sets you free, you will be free indeed. In the Declaration of Independence, it says, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, which are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And then one of the Constitution says, Congress shall make no law respecting the establishment of religion, prohibiting the free exercise of it, abridging the freedom of speech, or the press, or the right of people to peacefully assemble. As I have been to a couple of these meetings to hear about what is the heart of Wild Lake Schools, I have heard bigotry, bullying discussed, along with situations that concern minors. I see three new board members who have been rightfully voted into this school board by members of the community. I'm asking rhetorical questions here to promote thought. What is the purpose of school? 
Growing up, I received a college preparatory education here in the public schools of Michigan. Beliefs or ideology regarding my race, faith, or gender were not part of the public school space. Attached to education in the public schools is tax funding by its community members. I see two groups of parents on different sides. Are you saying that only one side has the, has the say and the right to free speech? All men and women are created by God, as it says and talks about in the scriptures, and that he created the male and female. Parents who disagree with the beliefs of race and gender theory don't want to talk to their children or want to pay for it being forced upon their children in public school. I suggest a two-track system where parents who want the say, the freedom and rights they hold based on the Ju Judeo-Christian beliefs supporting scriptures and who also support or support the Declaration of Independence and Constitution can place their children in a school supportive of those ideas. These parents want their children educated and prepared for life after school with that education supporting that their children are their own, not the government's. Then the parents who support race and gender theory can place their children in a school that supports those only. In conclusion, at this point in time in the history of our communities, <clears throat> and, and there is an attempt to intimidate our free speech. As parents, family, and friends of those who have children in this district, we disagree with this attempted intimidation and we stand firm against it. The only way I see public school getting back on track is to return to protecting parental rights of their children as minors, where there is no indoctrination of beliefs or of gender or race theory. 30 seconds. This will help eliminate bigotry and bullying. This will help eliminate that. And finally, I hope this board can work together to promote a safe place for children to learn reading, writing, math, history, science, and the fine arts. Thank you. Linda Brandes, Linda Brandes. Yep, yep, sorry. Good evening. Thank you again, all of you, for the time that you put into trying to make our schools a better place. Um, thank you for this time to share a few thoughts with you. Um, I have a few topics that I want to address tonight. Uh, the first is speaking at this podium. I would like to know if there's been any further work to create a policy for our underage speakers. Given that some on the board have had issue with local meetings updating public to current comments, uh, this topic needs to be addressed. I believe looking from a legal perspective, I'm sure the school district's council would advise that the current release should have a parent or guardian signature for those not yet at a legal age to offer consent, indicating that they acknowledge and allow their child to enter into the public forum, understanding that once they do so, there are no further protections of their privacy. I would like to receive uh, by email any policy in effect. Um, and I'd like to add to that that um, it's been noted these kids are very eloquent. Um, they have a right to speak. I want to hear what they have to say but they have to understand that once you come to this podium and that you are on a public television, there is no coming back from that, the same as being on any other social media. As a school safety month, I would also like to once again request this body look at steps and the funding required to achieve a higher security plan for each school in our district. Having safety officers present in all schools while children are in the building is a good first step to secure our children, our teachers, and our district workers, all serving to, deserving to feel safe while at school. To my knowledge, I've still not seen where the million dollars plus is going within our district, and certainly safety should have been at the top of the list for the spending priorities. Using these funds will give time for future budget decisions to continue showing the community that our children's safety is part of every child every day, a phrase we hear often. Finally, I know many are here tonight are concerned with teaching aids currently being used for creative writing in the early grades. This is just another break from the trust that we give you as parents and community members to install best practices, ensuring an increase in proficiency. Please be assured that this current plan is more disturbing to many that teachers would use a rapper expressing his big feelings about coming out as gay to second grade age students to teach children how to write. But my bigger problem is not with teaching the use of pronouns, is that, that we use Lucy Calkins reading and writing projects at all. Even Columbia's teacher college no longer trains teachers in this whole language style of learning. I'm almost done. Because they know it doesn't work. 
Would this district use any Lucy Calkins program? Studies have proven that phonics-based programs are superior in outcome to this sight-reading style of learning. It's concerning that I was unable to find not one study or paper cited that gives support to the subject of our readers to this program, subjecting our readers to this program. Parents can go to legacy.mischooldata.org, research your own school. Once on the site, select parent dashboard Time. to see documented measurements for your school. Currently, Commerce Elementary has only a 58 proficiency rating, and this is the average of most schools. That is unacceptable. And I'm sure we're all working toward it, but we need to start looking at different ways to have our kids learning to read um, and math. Uh, maybe if we were to worry less about teaching current social norms and work to keep our eye on making sure the students in this district can read, helping to assure that they will go to college prepared will make them better citizens. I thank you. Thanks. <laughs> William Lensbury. Hi, I'm William Lonsbury. Um, I'm a product of Wall Lake Consolidated School District. Uh, my children both are. Um, my thunder's got taken away by the last couple of speakers, so I will just hit a couple high points on this uh, second grade indoctrination into the whole sex porn thing. Um, why our tax dollars? Why do you all allow the people to make those decisions to make those decisions? This wouldn't sm pass the smell test anywhere. Um, so it's rogue sex ideology. Most of you should be as angry as I am or the other people in this room. You're 18 years old, you get to make those decisions on your own. To leave here tonight, go home, make a change, remove this from our school district. Thank you. Marlene Pallets. I apologize if I got that wrong. My topic today is gender. The biggest single policy catalyst for the transgender explosion was Obamacare. When Obamacare was enacted in 2010, it was included into the law, a provision in which insurance companies were mandated to provide coverage for what is deemed to be medically necessary gender-affirming care. As a result of that, just between 2010 and 2016, there was a 50% increase in sex reassignment surgeries. Of all procedures recorded by the American Society for Plastic Engineers, sorry, sorry plastic surgeons, sex reassignment surgery was among the most rapidly increasing between 2016 to 2017. It increased by 155% in this period with a 289% increase for transgender men and a 41% increase for transgender women. In 2021, about 42,000 children and teens across the United States received a diagnosis of gender dysphoria, nearly triple the number in 2017. This is according to writers. Thank you. Hal Wolf. Good evening. <clears throat> it appears that uh, several of my predecessors have stolen some of my thunder. <laughs> so I'm, I'm going to just uh, talk a little bit about your writer's workshop. Uh, it doesn't make sense to me uh, how you would uh, be teaching 
young kids, second graders, uh, about uh, using an example of this rapper that's, his songs are pornographic and so forth. Um, but let me just give you a few examples of real courage and bravery that you might switch this guy out for. Harriet Tubman, leading 300 slaves uh, to freedom on the Underground Railroad. Rosa Parks, we all know what she did, right? Uh, Patrick Henry, give me liberty or give me death. And the rest of the revolutionaries that uh, set us free from uh, the tyranny of Britain, uh, some of which my documented ancestors fought for. Uh, police officers, firefighters, etc. during the 9-11 uh, tragedy in New York. Those people are, are very brave. So I just want to say that there are examples that should be used that aren't, and there are ones being used that should not be. Thank you. Carl Gretzinger. Good evening, and thank you for the opportunity to speak. Uh, my name is Carl Gretzinger. I have two topics for tonight. The first one is two courses that I think should be given consideration for inclusion in the Walled Lake District. The second part could be called many things, but I call it empowering local school boards to have more authority. So part one is really 1A and 1B. 1A, I advocate uh, teaching the history of Russia from 1850 to 1950, because in this period of time, was the most horrid tragedy that could be imagined. The Russian people were duped, um, that they would have a revolution, that there would be a temporary dictatorship, and that they would transition to a true communism of each to his own ability, each to his or her own needs, and the final withering away of the state. Well, the state didn't wither away. And for a century, the Russian people have been oppressed beyond anything you can think of, and people need to understand that. The second course, um, I just switched over from like uh, surgery to readers. <laughs> I, can't, <laughs> I can't read anything. I can sure see a long way either way. Sorry, okay. So the second course, I think, to go quickly, because I want to spend some more time on my third topic, is this uh, book is entitled Agenda 230, and I think that should be the subject of coursework because what this book is about is a nurse and a mother and a wife who started to feel uncomfortable about things, and so she decided to dig into what's really going on. And there is the World Economic Forum, and Governor Whitmer has gone there this year for their yearly uh, uh, meeting, and the city of Detroit is on their list as the pilot program for what they envision as the new world. And it's pretty scary. It involves governance by unelected officials, uh, population control, open borders, et cetera. There's a lot in here. There's a lot to learn. The students of today are going to face this tomorrow by 2030. That's what they want to do. OK, and my third topic is um, how a course gets into the Walled Lake School District and the flaws that I find in that course. And of course, there is a course here that we've talked about, and it's kind of the case in point of what I call seconds. the transgendering teachings. And here's what I say. The Constitution of the United States is very clear in that it states those powers delegated to the federal government is all they get. Those powers not delegated to the federal government are reserved to the states or, repeat, or the people. And so I don't think the U.S. Department of Education has any right to tell anybody what to do. To hell with them. That's what I think. They do not have a constitutional right to exist. They were not in the Constitution. They were not in an amendment. Forget them. If the people don't want it, we shouldn't have to have it. Thank you. Thank you. Becky Behrens.
I'm sorry, I called Becky Barons. Oh. Sorry if it didn't come out. That's okay. <laughs> I, I promise we'll call your name. <laughs> Good evening. Uh, my name is Dr. Becky Behrens, and I had previously made comments uh, before this board about iReady, which is an online program for reading and math, K through eight, which is used in our school district. It is designed to help teachers determine their students' needs and personalize their learning and monitor their progress. Mrs. Kozanski has been very helpful in explaining this program to me as I have ongoing discussions with her about iReady, and I appreciate that. So I have some additional questions and comments about this. I talked to a parent recently about her eighth grade daughter's experience with iReady. She said her daughter went through three hours of iReady testing. Near the end of testing, she was just clicking on any answer to get done with the test. She has a 4.0 grade point average in math and reading, but her recent iReady scores said that she was below grade level in reading comprehension. Her mother spoke to the principal who was very helpful and concerned. He said that maybe testing should be done in smaller chunks. And he also said that 300 other kids were behind in reading comprehension per iReady testing as well. It is my understanding that teachers do not see the online responses of students' test. They don't see the correct or incorrect answers. Kids are then kicked back to prior levels of instruction which is on the computer, which is repetitive of much material they already had learned, and therefore they become extremely bored. Why not go over the specific questions they missed, or is it easier to just stick the kid in front of a computer screen rather than receive individualized help from a teacher? Those who market iReady say it should not be used for grading, but I have heard and read that teachers often resort to using it for grading in overcrowded classrooms because they are overwhelmed or in classrooms with too many kids below grade level. Thus, it replaces the teacher's knowledge and personal observations about students. I realize that COVID learning loss plays a role in lower reading score results. But you know, reading problems existed long before COVID hit. From what I remember of the last iReady scores in our district, there was some improvement in reading scores, but there was still a significant percentage below where they should be. 30 seconds. Why are the proposed remedies suggested by iReady not causing significant improvements overall in all the schools in our district in reading and math? I, heap, I keep hearing comments from parents that their kids hate iReady. I realize there are many factors that play into this problem. Dysfunctional families, kids raised in the TikTok era who have no patience or desire to read books, households with two working parents too exhausted to pick up the Time. pieces and help their kids. I'm almost finished. But we also need to look at teaching and testing methods and philosophies. Are we long overdue for a course correction? I would ask the school board members to dig into this as there is nothing more important than getting the next generation of kids to be able to read well and understand math. Thank you. Thanks. Robert Goffey. Okay. Okay. I have a few things uh, tonight. Um, mostly, I guess I come up here and relate what I heard the, the last month. And last time I heard a couple people give long diatribes uh, about conservatives and their supposed proclivity towards banning books. Uh, I just want to say nothing could be farther from the truth. It is conservatives that have pushed for free speech and fighting against censorship. Clearly, the gentlemen who made these accusation, accusations don't understand the difference between advoca advocating for age-appropriate subject matter in school libraries and the complete bans of books. Any adult who wants to read books to, to educate themselves on issues of sexual nature is free to do so and Nobody cares. But it's like this. If I walked up to a six-year-old boy on a playground and showed him pictures of two men engaging in oral sex, I would be arrested and considered a pedophile, predator, or other brand of sexual deviant. 
So why is it okay for that same material to be available for our kids to view in school? It's simply not. We also, also witnessed a man attack one of the board members, Ms. Tice, claiming that the use of her Christian values as part of her judgment is not acceptable in public institution. As seen for decades, the public totally misconstrues the con Constitution's division of church and state. What the Constitution directs is that the government and the church not be one and the same. However, there is no problem with the influence of things such as the Ten Commandments and Judeo-Christian concepts, or other re religious concepts for that matter, be considered or utilized in forming government and public policy. In fact, the U.S. was built on Judeo-Christian principles. Ms. Tice had every right to use her conscience as her guide, and in fact, it would have been derelict to not do so. Finally, last month, I was confronted for calling out, uh, calling teachers Marxist. I explained that to this person that this, it was a teacher, that if you believe in and push DEI, you are a Marxist, since equity is a Marxist socialist construct. Further, I had to explain to a former board mem member that came upon us that equity does not mean equal. Equity means the same outcomes. This is, by definition, socialism. So all you people pushing DEI, you're pushing socialism, and we, we don't like it. The fact that a board member didn't know this explains a lot. I'm guessing most of the educators across America are in the same boat. 30 seconds. I suggest you all read up on Marxism, socialism, communism, fascism, and any other isms. Then maybe you will understand our concerns about DEI, CRT, SEL, and the other alphabet soup initiatives that are being used to push Marxist concepts and division amongst us. One last comment. Uh, I've heard a lot of things here tonight that everything comes down to money. Uh, a lot of people are asking for more security and these types of things. Everything we've heard has been about we need more money. So I guess I'd really like to ask everyone on the board to tell us why we have three schools and what's the plan for diminishing it and redu reducing some of these expenses. Ron Lippett. Ron Lippett. Good evening. Ron Lippett, Commerce Township. My uh, wife, Denise, and I are 20 year residents of the community. We have three daughters who have absolutely thrived in Wild Lake schools, including our youngest, who is a sophomore uh, right now at Wild Lake Northern. Uh, the great comedian philosopher John Mulaney, uh, responding to criticism on why he never took interest in politics prior to 2016, reinforced a common truth, and that is. I don't check up on people when they seem to be doing good at their job. And I'm lazy by nature, he added. Uh, you may think that's an ignorant answer, but it's not. It's a great answer. Mr. Mullaney wasn't wrong. Mundane school boards of the past were important, to be sure, but hardly the culture war uh, front line in which we find ourselves today. We used to not pay attention. 20 years before coming to this community, I hardly expected to be up here talking about book banning, book banning in Commerce Township, Michigan. It's a notion almost as toxic as it is embarrassing. I have spent a career in consulting and the best outcomes often come when partners understand a root cause of an issue. One of the most trusted models we use is something called the five whys root cause analysis, five whys. Five whys, essentially asking why, five times in a row to get to a root cause. So if you don't mind, I'd like to apply five whys to book banning. Why number one, why are we banning some books? Yes, we are banning books. Answer, to prevent children's access to them. Why number two, why are we preventing children's access to them? Answer, to prevent them from being impacted by their content or perhaps making decisions that they wouldn't otherwise make. Why number three? Why do we not want them impacted by the content? The answer, because some may discover that children might empathize with, grow accepting of, or worst of all, personally align with content which others might find controversial. Why number four? Why do we want, not want them impacted by the content? Why number four? Why do we not want children empathizing or aligning with controversial content? The answer, 
because this might run in contract, uh, contradiction to moral beliefs. 30 seconds. And some may fear this may shine a light on many of us who are already in the community. And why number five, finally, why do we not want a light shined on the truth of who we are? Answer, because many of the in the community have fear. Fear of what happens when love and knowledge and support creates empowered kids who become mentors and leaders of future generation. Fear lies at the heart of our issues. Fear of who we already are. I ask the board to Time. consider a simple question. Does banning books strengthen the potential of our schools or does it empower fear, fear of acceptance, inclusion, and love? Thank you. Tim Sawmiller. Tim Sawmiller. Good evening, Tim Sawmiller, Commerce Township. I'm a cisgender male using pronouns he, him, and his. Unlike some speakers that appear at this podium, I live in the district. The term secularism is a relatively easy and straightforward one to define. At its most basic level, secularism is a commitment to upholding the separation of church and state. Anti-government extremist hate groups like Moms for Liberty and the Great Schools Initiative lobby for book bans and changes in curriculum that erase the lived histories of and present experiences of black, brown, indigenous, and LGBTQ people, all in the name of religion. Public schools aren't just about learning certain subjects. They are also where kids learn the civic virtues needed for our society to function. Kids practice getting along with each other and respecting people from different cultures and experiences. But those values run counter to what these Christian nationalists want, which is a society run by and for a small segment of people that they deem worthy. They do not represent most parents nor most people's views on education. A strong majority of Americans oppose book banning. About two thirds of the general population and even 51% of Republicans oppose it, recognizing that it presages the rise of authoritarianism. Judge Katanji Brown tells us, the work of our time is maintaining our hard-won freedom, and to do that, we are gonna need the truth, the whole truth about our past. We must teach it to our children and preserve it for theirs. Knowledge of the past is what enables us to mark, mark our forward progress. If we are going to continue to move forward as a nation, we cannot allow concern about discomfort to displace knowledge, truth, or history." End of quote. Not teaching students about the injustices black and indigenous people face to this day as a result of colonialism is a conscientious erasure of history that benefits white supremacy. Teaching children about ideas you may disagree with is not indoctrination. Teaching children only about ideas you do agree with is the very definition of indoctrination. A rainbow won't make your child gay. They're born that way. A display won't make your kids trans. They're born that way. If you don't love and accept them for who they are, you're an awful parent. They haven't failed, you have. 30 seconds. Kids that are loved at home come to school to learn. Kids that aren't loved at home come to school to be loved. Good people don't spend their time harassing marginalized communities and publicly attacking kids at school board meetings. You know, I have no energy for hate. I either love you, wish you well, or hope that you heal. Remember that every kind of love is better than any kind of hate. Thank you. Jan Rechtenwald. Jan Rechtenwald, to get it close. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Jan Rechtenwald. I'm a retired school teacher, and I was the first PTA president of Pleasant Lake Elementary School. And I thank you for taking the time to hear me. I would like to think that we all have the same goal to educate in an environment where kids can be safe and curious and happy. Parents create safe places where children can just enjoy being kids. And all parents want their schools to be safe places for their children, physically and psychologically. But our culture seems bent on indoctrinating young minds. There's a new contagion that has quietly crept in to infect 
and transform children. It was given a name in 2018, study called Rapid Onset Generation Gender Dysphoria. With that said, I have great concerns about the agenda that you as members of Walled, State, Walled Lake School Board have concerning sexualizing children. Raising children in this culture can be an overwhelming task, but when the school is targeting our children with inappropriate sexual propaganda, we parents must do everything we can to protect them. Many of us here are here out of concern that the schools are trying to normalize radical sexual ideology. Please, please do what is right for our children. Protect our children from programs like comprehensive sexuality education. Parents are not the enemy. We want to work together with Walled Lake Schools to raise healthy children so they can become healthy adults. We teach our children about boundaries concerning private parts at a very early age. We help them to respect others, and setting healthy boundaries has always been a top priority. By age 10, puberty has begun. It's natural for them to feel socially insecure and confused about the changes in their body. We are the ones who help them to sort it out. We are the ones who lift them up so they know they have a beautiful body. Sometimes parents need to help children embrace their biological gender, but this should not be the norm. We are the ones who warn innocent children to stay away from pornography because it will negatively affect them all of the days of their lives. Do parents feel that Wald Lake School teachers are providing an environment that encourages healthy sexual boundaries? Are Wald Lake schools encouraging their seconds. students to embrace who they are biologically and to communicate openly with parents? Increasingly, radical activists have been able to use the schools to propagate their beliefs in all sorts of things, LGBT issues, all sorts of things. And many schools keep this hidden beyond the watchful eye of parents. We are here to ask you to be transparent about your policies on things like sex education, gender theory, and gender change requests. Let's do this together. Don't allow Time. the progressive culture pressures to influence education to our schools. We want to work with you to raise children to be healthy adults. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Jonathan Tassis. Jonathan Tassis. Good evening, everyone. I am a retired police officer, Jonathan Tassis. I uh, started a business, Oakland Canine, which is, uh, specializes in security with schools. What I have established is I use highly trained detection dogs to detect firearms as well as explosives and hire retired police officers as well to be concealed carry where there is no open weapon shown anywhere or any place inside the school. Not to mention with this, they are role models, men and women that have served the thin blue line and are looking to continue to do that with our kids and keep them safe, our staff as well. The best part about my program is I take no money from the school budget. I've already established federal grants that will cover my payment and are already in the mix to establish more. Every ounce of payment, nothing comes out of the school budget. Uh, I look forward to talking with you more in depth about this, because not only is it detection and protection, we can also specialize in case students get lost and having canines track them. Whenever there is also, perfect example, everybody here has three minutes. Do you know how much bad can happen in three minutes? There is already a trained officer on scene with a trained canine that also couples as a therapy dog. <laughs> so when the dog is not working, he's here to comfort kids, have time to play, and I don't use the, the mark do not pet on the side of my uh, vest for my dogs. It's ask the pet, okay? Because when the dog is working, it needs to concentrate. It needs to stay in line and find what it's looking for and get its reward. I'm a father. I'm a husband. I want the best for all of our kids. And there is no room for fear in schools. There are so many children 
that don't have positive households, and their only outlet is the school system. Fear should not be tolerated. I'm asking you please to consider this. I have further information galore, and I will seconds. answer any questions that anybody has. Thank you very much for your time, and I appreciate seeing you all again. Thank you. Evelyn Boisvert. Hello, my name is Evelyn. I go to Walnut Creek Middle School and I'm in eighth grade. Why do they do it? It's a cruel and heartless act, so why? I, they've heard the effects, they've been to the bullying assemblies, and yet they still scrutinize us with their insecurities and inabilities. They treat us as if we're their guinea pigs, T a test subject, seeing how long and how far they have to take it for us to fall apart, as if we have little to no meaning. Well, to that I say, I am done being their guinea pig. They have sold many things from me, including my self-esteem and self-love, and my scientific calculator. <laughs> bullying has its effects, many people know I know have wanted to hurt themselves because of this. That's not okay. Your motto is every child, every day, but clearly this is only surface level. We need to implement stronger consequences for bullying or at least get some form of justice. It needs to stop getting overlooked. This is such a huge thing that gets so little attention. Staff should be better trained to spot, identify, and handle bullying. I hate the idea of a child thinking they are worthy of bully bullying because at one point I was there. I've been bullied and I still get bullied. No one deserves to hate themselves. The most common age for suicide in children is between 12 and 17, which is the, also the age that most bullying happens. We should not expect the fact that it, we, should not, we should not accept the fact that a child is making another child feel like killing themselves is the only option. Another thing we could apply is the resources for bullies themselves. We should give them ways to get help if they are struggling. Change will happen when we start implementing it. So giving the bullies help will make it so that they don't bully again. Punishments only do so much to teach them. Please consider some of these ideas and the topic itself. I don't know how much longer your kids can take getting bullied. Also, a little bit of a shout out, Walnut Creek is working with me and my friends to crack down on some bullying, and I am very thankful for that. Thank you. Lee Osborne, Lee Osborne. Hello everybody, my name's Lee. Uh, I just, when I come in, when I arrive in, I get the card that I put my name on. That's, and on the back it states that their name calling will not be tolerated. I've been coming here for the last three times and some, sometimes it just doesn't work because uh, it should be corrected that name calling is not tolerated unless you are directing it to the insults toward three board members. Those three board members have been name called. And it's outrageous that the board president allows this to happen to our citizens, to allow citizens to get up and disgrace setting board members. In the future, I'd like to see the board members treat everyone equally. Thank you. Jeanette Wareham. Thank you for letting me speak tonight. Um, every year, the United States welcomes nearly one million new citizens through the naturalization ceremonies. All these people must pay us the U.S. citizenship test by answering six out of 10 questions correctly. While well, 90% of legal immigrant applicants pass the exam, only 3% of public high school students in America can pass the US citizenship test. That's a shame. If we wanna restore pride in America, let's look at ways we fail to educate our kids on the simple principles of citizenship. What can we do to increase our students' knowledge about the founding principles of this great country we live in? 
There are many divisive things that are brought up at our school board meetings, but I hope and I believe that 90% of the parents in this district would support increasing the goal to raise the number of students capable of passing the U.S. Citizens Test to at least 10% and setting goals to double that number each year. Wouldn't it be wonderful if Wald Lake School District could someday be a shining example of passing the citizenship exam equal to 90% of those new legal immigrant applicants? Hopefully we could also match the enthusiasm that these new citizens have for the opportunity of living in America, which many of us take for granted. Thank you. Mike Wise, probably couldn't hear me when I had my mic off, sorry. <laughs> Mike Wise, Wall Lake uh, School uh, resident, 22 years. Here who is familiar with the group Moms for Liberty? A quote, he alone who owns the youth gains the future. I repeat, he alone who owns the youth gains the future. Quote by Adolf Hitler. From the Moms for Liberty publication from Hamilton County, Indiana, June 2023. In 1933, Nazi right-wing conservative-dominated German groups carried out public burnings of books they claimed were un-German. The book burnings took place in 34 towns and cities. The book burnings stood as a powerful symbol of Nazi right-wing conservative intolerance, hatred, racism, and as we see here during public commentary sessions in Wall Lake School Board meetings, censorship. The Nazi right-wing conservative book banning and ba uh, burning and banning in 33 is probably the most famous book burning and banning in history. I believe we will catch up with it here in the United States unless voters wake up to the anti-inclusion, anti-acceptance, racism, and un-American pressure being brought to bear by right-wing conservative extremist groups on our public schools and public libraries. In 1933, conservative right-wing Nazi German authorities aimed to synchronize professional and cultural organizations with Nazi ideology and policy by burning books. Joseph Goebbels, Hitler, Hitler's Nazi propaganda minister, succeeded by bringing German arts, culture, literature, and ways of thinking in line with extremist conservative right-wing Nazi goals. Once the Nazis were in charge, they purged cultural organizations and took direct control of government, governmental entities, including the German military. They murdered officials, including newspaper publishers, journalists, radio broadcasters, and teachers, alleged to be politically left and suspect, and who performed or created artworks or literature or writings or worked in scientific fields which Nazi ideologues labeled degenerate. Sound familiar? A certain element is determined to abolish government entities in the United States, like the Department of Education, the National Endowment for the Arts, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, the Department of Health and Human Services, and to defund the Department of Justice, including the FBI. In a symbolic act of ominous significance, in May 1933, German Nazi mobs burned upwards of 25,000 volumes of un-German books, pre-staging an era of state censorship and control of culture and what people were allowed to think. On May 10, 1933, right-wing mobs marched in torchlight parades, similar to what happened at the neo-Nazi march in Charlottesville, Virginia on August 12, 2017, about Charlottesville. We got to hear a uh, to be unnamed politician say, there were good people on both sides. In Nazi Germany, the scripted rituals called for Time. Nazi right-wing officials to address the participants and spectators with nationalistic right-wing hate at similar Nazi torchlight rallies. Nazi mobs threw pillaged books yeah, onto bonfires with if great you could just ceremony. Finish, I think. Appreciate it. Okay. In Berlin, 40,000 persons gathered to hear Joseph Goebbels deliver a fiery address. Goebbels enjoined the crowd. I consigned to the flames the writings of Heinrich Mann, Ernest Glaser, Ernest Hemingway, Jack London, and Helen Keller. These writers believed in social justice, believed in improved conditions for workers, and supported women's rights. Nazi propaganda was a resounding success, receiving widespread newspaper and radio coverage. In Berlin, radio broadcasts brought the speeches and songs and chants to Nazi Germans. Nazis started by burning books, but ended up burning people. Thank you. Kelly Shruba. Somebody left the yeah, 
I was going to thank you for that. Yes, thank you. <laughs> she gave me phonetics, so I would pronounce her name correctly. So I work with kids. You know, we all have that a struggle. That's very nice. Good. <laughs> uh, so thank you for letting me speak. My name is Kelly Shruba, and I'm a resident of Wixom. I have two kids that are being very well educated and supported without, within the school. Um, I was going to end with it, but I'm going to start with it. Go band. So, <laughs> yay. But um, I just wanted to make a couple of few statements. I, I'm not... <laughs> As we're continually hearing about school districts around the country and other states banning books, as we've been talking about, thanks, Mike, um, and we hear about the rise in hatred amongst all of us when we have a common goal of taking care of our kids, okay? Um, I just keep hearing about the hatred for LGBTQ and, again, a hatred for inclusion. Um, I'm hearing anti-racism. I'm hearing a lot of anti yeah, right? So we should hear a lot more for. And I would have to say that I've been grateful overall. I mean, we've, we've got a lot to learn. We've got a lot going on in the district. But I'm really a proud parent in the Wild Lake Schools. We moved here from Chicago back to Michigan so our kids would get a good education and be supported. We didn't know what they were. They were just little blobs. And I would have to say um, overall the environment in Wild Lake School District has been very open. Um, open towards the inclusion. I love that our district is, has everybody in it. We have people low income, high income, all colors and LGBTQ plus, and we're allowing our kids to recognize their preferred pronouns, their names, because they're kids. We can grow, we can change, we can have different things, but let's keep them in the schools and learning, not just high suicide rate, 12 to 17. My kids are in that range, right? Um, we, we try to talk to our kids. We try to talk to them about what's going on. And that's part of like, my husband and I talk to our kids about what movies they can watch, what books they can read. But it's the school's opportunity to provide those discussions, to provide the opportunity to hear things that I didn't hear about. I'm not a teacher, I'm an OT, but I'm not a teacher. I just have to say, I'm very thankful for the way that we do review the curriculum. I was very happy to hear those books pass. After our very strong curriculum review recommended books, we accepted them. And teachers then take it like you have the dictionary. You don't use every word in it. The teacher knows their classroom. They use what they need. 30 seconds. And I would just have to say, thank you, Wild Lake School District. Thank you for keeping inclusion. Thank you for listening to our children. Um, we can always do better. There's some things that were talked about on everybody's page that we can work together on, maybe make some changes, some improvements, but keeping open, keeping them alive, and I'd have to say, not with guns in the schools, but more with gun safety laws, but that's not our school district, but keeping our positive and support and love in our schools, because that's what we want Time. them to be in the community. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, and someone left glasses up here? I don't know, somebody's glasses. Oh. <laughs> yep, it, 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 yep. <laughs> Nancy Van Leeuwen. I will be brief. Um, number one, with Mrs. Kaplan's absence, I would like to uh, Big, give a big shout out to all of the people who supported Lakes Area Youth Assistance with our Taste of the Lakes event. It was very successful. Um, we had some of the nicest comments from the public saying how great things were. So we appreciated the support. We always appreciate the support of the district, our cabinet, those people that uh, participate, buy tickets, and help us out. So thank you very much for that. Um, I also want to comment, um, there's been a lot going on this evening, and I don't want to belabor it. One of our board members, our current board members, had a posting on Facebook that uh, she ended with, United we stand and divided we fall. It's a good one, and I'm hearing the division tonight. I'm sorry. Um, I'm sorry you have to sit and listen to all of this. I'm sorry you have to hear words like propaganda and indoctrination. Um, some of these terms that are derogatory. I'm sorry you have to hear express, expressions of dislike or distrust in what you are doing. I'm sorry our staff 
has to hear those comments that they are not trusted to do the job they were trained and hired to do. Um, I hope that we can come to the United We Stand. It's pretty critical at this time, and Wald Lake Schools deserves that. Thank you. Susie Crafton. Hi there. I'd like to start by grounding us in language commonly used across the district. From the board approved student code of conduct, the district believes in the development of each student's potential for learning in a positive, orderly, and safe school district. From the school district's belief statements, quoted in part, physical and psychological safety is critical to learning. Number two, we are participants in a global society and value diversity. I'd like everyone in this room to think about these statements. Have the people in the room behave in this room been behaving in alignment with these stated commitments and beliefs? Over the past many months, and sadly tonight, I think not. Therefore, I have two very specific and actionable requests of the board that, based on my research, are within your governance role and comply with the First Amendment and the Open Meetings Act. First, before public comment, I request this statement be made asking that all, all speakers comply with the district's code of conduct, which I will quote in part. The Board of Education is committed to preventing and prohibiting bullying at school. Bullying is defined in part as verbal communication that is intended or that a reasonable person would know is likely to harm one or more district students, either directly or indirectly, by, and then there's a few examples. One, adversely affecting a student's ability to participate in or benefit from educational programs by placing a student in reasonable fear of physical harm or by causing substantial emotional distress, or two, having an actual detrimental effect on students' physical or mental health. At school, for purposes of this policy, means anywhere on school premises, on a bus, and at a school-sponsored activity. Some of the behaviors in the September meeting's public comment blatantly violated both, state, both stated components of the bullying definition. And previous meetings have also had public commentary that is likely to have placed a student in reasonable fear or physical harm or caused emotional distress. And this is a school-sponsored activity, and we are on school premises. 30 seconds. I implore all trustees to raise the public comment behavior expectations, at least to the bar we have in place for our students. My second request, we're a district comprised of nine municipalities, some in whole, some in part. I would like to see the board president request that those offering public comment identify the municipality they live in and if they are a direct stakeholder of this district or not. For example, I live in the part of Novi that is zoned to Wald Lake Schools. So I would introduce myself, Susie Crafton, Novi resident, Time. direct stakeholder to the district. A speaker that also lives in Novi, but is zoned to Novi Public Schools, would then introduce themselves as a Novi resident, not a direct stakeholder to this district. Thank you. Christine Titus. Good evening, um, Mrs. Crafton. Um, thank you, I know I'm supposed to address my comments to the board, but um, I've been thinking along those same lines. So Christine Titus, resident of Commerce Township, 32 years, um, stakeholder in our district. Um, as I was sitting here listening tonight, I was number one offended by the characterization of teachers as those that indoctrinate the students. That is far from the truth. Um, I also heard um, information about iReady. I'd like to um, repeat, as I've heard Mrs. Kohansky repeat many times, that it's only one measure of how we measure student progress um, or not. Um, and then the idea of teacher guides, um, they're but one part of a bigger toolbox that we employ to deliver curriculum to our students. I'm a current teacher in the district. I'm an instructional specialist at Hickory Woods Elementary. 
I think there's a misconception about teacher guides that are helpful to our teaching and the changes that come about in our global society. Uh, if you think about math, when the digital age came in, analog kind of started to go away. I wish it were still around. I think there's value still in teaching kids about analog. Um, science, we have the new next generation science standards. We need to change teacher guides. Social studies, think about the global impact of social studies and the changes in countries and boundaries. English language arts, there's novels moving from what used to be more of a homogenous focus to a more diverse focus, and we should be celebrating that. Um, teacher's guides are just a guide. However, they can give a new teacher guidance into what might be new curriculum and a veteran teacher insight into changes that are reflected in the new editions of textbooks that come out. However, they're just guidance if needed. A professional educator knows his or her students and may or may not take that guidance depending on the needs of that student population, which changes every year. Okay, our student population and their families also reflect changes in our school community and a classroom teacher will be sensitive to those nuances. As an example, perhaps a classroom may have a student who has suffered the loss of a close family member. A teacher aware of this may choose to not use a text where this kind of loss is highlighted, being sensitive to the student's needs, or on the conversely seconds. may use that text as a mentor of how to deal with grief. Again, this comes from the educator knowing the students in the classroom. My point, which I've made in the past, is to trust us as the professionals we are, trust us to know our students, our families, and our school community. Thank you. Okay, I can move on in the agenda or we can take five. Does anybody need five? Let's take five. Okay, let's take five. We'll come back at uh, just a couple minutes after nine. Thank you.
minutes of our, our regular meeting. We are going to open tonight with Mr. Chatfield. Thank You're welcome. You, Thank you, Dr. Bernia. Uh, just, uh, just a quick update. Uh, in case you drive by any of the high schools, uh, you will see starting uh, this week, actually, uh, construction activities around the um, athletic team buildings that are being laid out and will soon be um, you'll see a groundbreaking uh, at stadium sites and um, the western field will wait and uh, we'll start that construction after the pink out game next week but we're excited to get those projects rolling and uh, get those open next spring so thank you mr russo thank you dr bernie uh, i have two things tonight uh first is that uh, our golden apple award uh miss van wagner i just wanted everyone to know that that was my very first hire in the district so i'm very proud of that uh, <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, secondly, uh, it's my pleasure tonight as part of the consent agenda to recommend the appointment of Mr. Ryan West to the position of principal at Commerce Elementary. A little bit of background uh, for the board as a part of, as a part of the consent agenda. Um, Mr. West has served most recently as, prin as principal at Roosevelt Elementary in West Bloomfield since 2018. Previously, Mr. West served as principal at Elva Lynch Elementary in Lapeer Community Schools from 2014 to 2018. Mr. West has served as a middle school assistant principal and athletic director previously. And Mr. West is also a Wald Lake Consolidated School District community member where he has, a, where he has children at Clifford Smart Middle School and at Wald Lake Northern High School. Mr. West holds an educational specialist degree in educational leadership from the University of Michigan Flint, a Master of Arts in Sports Administration from Wayne State University, and a Bachelor of Arts in Elementary Education from Saginaw Valley State University. He holds an administrative certificate with a central office endorsement and a professional, and a professional teaching cert in the state of Michigan. Mr. West, pending board approval, will begin his post as principal at Commerce Elementary on October 16th. Ms. Muir. Nothing at this time, Dr. Bernier. Ms. Kohansky. I also have nothing tonight. Thank you, Dr. Bernier. Mr. Durkin. Nothing at this time, Dr. Bernier. Dr. Lons. Nothing at this time. I want to use my commentary uh, just to compliment uh, the, we're up and running in the fall. Uh, home, homecoming happened at Northern and Western. Homecoming is tomorrow at Central. Uh, the fun runs and the color runs are up. Uh, trunk or treat is right around the corner. So it's not just a matter of all of the exciting things that are happening inside our school buildings from the beginning of the day to the end. It's also all that exciting stuff that's going on outside the school day. And so I really want to compliment the commitment of our staff not just for coming in and doing their job, but for staying late to participate in some of those events that are, are so memorable and so important. And, and lastly, I wanna highlight, uh, just a few weeks ago, I, I took my daughter, my oldest daughter has just started playing volleyball. I took her to see uh, a game at the varsity at Wald Lake Western, and the, the young ladies on that team were exemplary and exactly what we would want our students to be. They were so warm and so kind to her. They gave her their time and talked with her and, and made her feel special. And just the other day, they were kind enough to send a care package to my office with a t-shirt that she wears every time it's clean. It's the first thing out of the rotation. Um, I know it's senior night for the ladies at Waldwick Western, but hopefully this message gets to them uh, how grateful I am and what an exemplary group of young women uh, that is exactly what we want our students to, to be and, and to act like throughout the district. Thank you. We're going to go on to board commentary. Ms. Tice? Um, well, Anything tonight? <laughs> sorry. Um, well, I know um, October is um, the month to appreciate all of our principals, and so I just want to acknowledge all of our principals across the district and just, um, just thank them for the tireless work that they do every day. Mr. Siegler? Last night I had the pleasure of uh, attending the Oakland Schools meeting. Uh, some of the things you'll be hearing in the near future is the School Research Collaborative Re Facility Study. And I know that uh, Mr. Chatfield is looking fo forward to that, as well as the Transportation Study and the Energy Studies that are all going to be happening. Uh, my hope is that these studies do result in some of the benefits that we have gained from the research collaborative <clears throat> initially and that they don't sit on a shelf somewhere uh, gathering dust. Also, you know, 
we're looking at sign die for the House and Senate as of November the 9th this year. Uh, a lot of bills and legislative action is still out there and still pending. Uh, there is possibilities of charter school reforms. Uh, the introduction is expected soon. The FAFSA form requirement for high school diplomas is still out on the floor. The Labor Day start bill, it's stalled on the House floor. Uh, it could be uh, fast-tracked before the uh, session is over. The educator administrator evaluations are expected in the Senate committee soon. Uh, there's new uh, items being looked at for legislation for dyslexia. The mandate for dental oral assessment, they think that's going to probably not be here. If it does show, it's possible that it might show in the uh, lame duck session. Um, the meals program is looking for possible another uh, adjustment. And uh, there is also a bill, it's a rumor right now, but uh, I, have a, I have this belief that rumors sometimes grow uh, requiring schools to allow ABA clinical providers to deliver medical and necessary services at schools during school hours. Uh, I think that it will probably get an initial introduction, but will not make it through this session. Uh, but I mean, there's a lot of things out there right now that are pending and we've got basically 12 days of in session for all of this to happen before they break for the uh, break. So for those of you who want to watch this or have any desire to watch it, keep your eyes peeled because I think things could happen quickly. Uh, as Ms. Van Leeuwen said, the Taste of the Likes was a phenomenal, uh, phenomenal event. Thank big spender. I'm not a big spender. I just enjoyed it. My, my wife has no idea until she sees us tonight. Uh, <laughs> uh, and uh, so, so, you know, that was wonderful. You know, we're coming out with the pink outs and everything else for October. Uh, looking forward to all of those events. It's a wonderful tribute by our students in memory of those who have passed or those who are currently suffering. And I want to give accolades to everybody involved in all of those programs. And then next on the agenda will be our plays and our shows coming up very soon. So keep your eyes peeled. Mm -hmm. Mrs. Fernandez. Thank you, Ms. Cascarande. I'm, I know it makes for long nights, but I'm really excited that we see more and more of the community here and we're striking, it feels like we're striking a better balance of some really um, great commentary to hear. And just tonight alone, we had everything from lunches to policies to canine to bullying to curriculum. And, and it is good for us to hear that type of commentary uh, so that we hear from all perspectives. The one that stumps me, that continues to stump me over and over again, is hearing um, folks who are passionate about book banning. And I say that just because earlier, when that became a topic of conversation, I asked if I've been in the district for 50 years, have we ever banned a single book? And I'm pretty sure it was probably a few months ago, but I'm pretty sure the answer is no. And so to me, that's like a fact checker thing, right? Like we have, we have a lot of passion around this, this thing and it gets labeled something and I don't think it's ever happened. And so I'm just gonna say, I'm gonna re-ask the question internally behind the scenes and see, cause we have had books come up and topics and I don't know if maybe that answer has changed, but um, to me it just feels like, let's keep bringing some of these things forward and take some of the things that are, um, that, that suck a lot of energy from other items and yeah I just wanted to say I'm pretty sure the answer to that was no very recently and I'll ask it again so thanks Mrs. Levin thank you Mrs. Cascarande um, so each of us like to introduce um, you know our board commentary with you know different topics and one thing I like to try to do is inform the community of like what I've been up to that relates to my time here on the board over the last, you know, since we last met. Um, so over the last uh, month or so, I have been putting in uh, a lot of hours um, going through some MASB, Michigan Association of School Board classes. Uh, I'm working toward my data skills specialty um, and it's uh, very eye-opening. Um, you know, I'm, I'm learning better questions to ask, learning things not to ask, learning 
how to interpret um, data that's, that's given to us. Um, probably asking Dr. Bernie a, a few too many questions, but that's okay because I think it's helpful for people to see the answers. Um, you know, whether we've been on the board for 10 months or we've been on the board for 30 years, um, sometimes getting a refresh on the answer I think is, is a good thing. So, um, you know, one of, one of my goals as, as we've gone into this school year is to really, really try to focus the conversations on student achievement. That's what we're all here for. The ideological stuff, it, it's not our place, it's not what any of us are here to do. And so my conversations, my work that I'm trying to put in is really on how do we provide the best outcomes for our students educationally, because that's what the school district is here to do. Um, there's different roles throughout the community. Uh, you know, doctors do medicine, parents do guiding of their children, schools teach academics. So I really want to focus my work on student achievement, the data surrounding that, how do we interpret the data, how do we ask the right questions to um, you know, get better outcomes. I also would be um, totally on a different topic, remiss if I didn't mention that um, last month was um, Childhood Cancer Awareness Month. Uh, I don't know that we did a whole lot for that, but there are certainly children in our own community that are suffering through this, um, this horrible disease um, every day. And so, uh, although we didn't officially recognize something last month, it is, it's always on our minds. Um, this month, October, is Dyslexia Awareness Month. Um, I think that's super important. We have a lot of kids that struggle with that, parents that struggle with how to help their kids with that. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, it's in, you know, we could make board proclamations for everything, but just a mention of that I think is important. Today, most important day, World Teachers Day, thank you to all of the teachers who, uh, you know, work tirelessly, um, not just during the school day, but, you know, at night, on the weekends, during the summer. Um, we see you, we hear you, um, and you know, speaking of teachers, one of the things that I, I also heard the community talk about tonight was um, you know, concerns about you know, some things in the curriculum, and we heard, um, you know, some people have already heard back from administrators, we as, as board members heard back that um, you know, concerns about the curriculum, are, you know, things are, are left to teacher discretion, right? And we hope and we assume that teachers will use their best discretion to not necessarily read everything in a teacher guide word for word, and, and that's great. I think teacher discretion or any professional discretion in any profession is very important. The things I'm concerned about as a board member are, what about the days when we don't have teacher discretion? What about the day when there's a substitute and the lesson plan says, do the writer's workshop unit two and somebody opens it up and they read it. That's a problem. Legally, that could be a problem, but that's just a problem if the, the material within that unit is controversial. What about if it's a brand new teacher who has not yet developed teacher discretion or that teacher discretion muscle, right? You don't even know what you don't know to even ask. And by the way, those new teachers, whether you're brand new or brand new to the district, you are on probation. And I don't know about you, but in any other profession, when you're on probation, you probably follow the rules pretty closely. Who are you gonna be to deviate from what the guide says? Maybe that's just how things work, but again, that can be problematic. But most importantly, and I brought this up on a vote um, you know, previously in, in my comments, we need to send our resources, the money that the taxpayers in our community count on us to spend wisely to vendors, publishers, businesses that we do business with, to those companies that stay away from the controversial stuff. I don't care if it's stuff we can ignore, we need to stop supporting it. Whether we're spending fifty thousand or five hundred thousand dollars, that's money. That's important. To throw away part of a curriculum means maybe we shouldn't be using it. So I am going to continue to scrutinize the curriculum. I will continue to come in here and review it, and I invite the community to do the same because, like somebody said, we can't read every page. But if more of us look at things, more of us can see other pages. And if something deserves a no vote, it's going to get that no vote from me, unless there's some sort of policy put into place that will allow us to not have to worry on an official capacity rather than just leaving it up to discretion because discretion means different things to different people. So I have heard from teachers who are afraid to speak up because they don't want to be the teacher who spoke up. They don't want to be the one that rocks the boat, but they know deep down inside something's wrong. In fact, one teacher said to me, I am here to teach, not to preach. And I hear you, I, I hear the teachers, I, I want to know that you are heard and supported, 
and I'm gonna continue to do whatever I can from where I'm sitting to provide you with that support and just know that I hear you. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Casagrande. Um, got a few different topics. So this kind of retired old guy is kind of getting in his groove. So he did a lot of things the last couple of weeks in the district. So uh, beginning of last week, I watched and uh, visited the Northern versus Milford boys varsity soccer game. Um, Northern uh, obviously did not prevail, but then again, my alma mater of where I coached for many years, Milford High did. Um, but I was not sure who I was really cheering for, um, <laughs> either way. But after there, we had our first bylaw meeting, which I will defer to Ms. Fernandez later in the meeting to give you some kind of a recap of how that, uh, that started off. Went on from there to watch Waldeck Northern and Waldeck Western play on Thursday night. If you remember last Thursday this week, it was pretty cool, kind of windy. Um, uh, Waldeck Western, I think, uh, probably the prime of the, the teams in our, in our uh, three school league. Um, I think it's probably the number one. They were well ahead at the end of the first half. Um, went on from there Monday, four o'clock was to visited and watch the first unified sports uh, soccer game at uh, Wall Lake Central. And um, great, hot day for them kids. Uh, they weren't, I, I don't think anybody was prepared for that. Obviously they didn't have a whole lot of time to prepare, but uh, they showed well. Um, the, team they played against obviously had been doing this a lot longer. So, but uh, I, I do expect good things from them down the road. Um, and they were very representative and very well engaged. Uh, went on from there to attend uh, the adult transitions program waves parent uh, session meeting at Wall Lake Western that evening. <clears throat> and uh, I wanna commend uh, Assistant Superintendent Murr, uh, did an excellent job in uh, piloting that meeting with the parents. Uh, I sat as a willful and uh, willing uh, advisor, oversight uh, viewer. Um, at one point, Ms. Muir asked me if she could identify who I was for those that didn't know who I was. And there were some people that were quite surprised that a board member actually had showed up to do that. But there were some issues that are still out there. Uh, they spoke, first of all, very highly of um, the teachers and staff there at uh, ATP. I have a somewhat um, experience with the adult transitions period uh, uh, program. Uh, it, it's, it's a phenomenal program for young people that uh, as they move out of high school um, and go on to having uh, uh, development learning skills uh, to try to give them some autonomy in life. Um, these do go on to their 26. There were some issues uh, that still are out there. Um, and I'll let, uh, let that stay with the assistant superintendent. Um, there was um, some vigorous conversation, um, no question about it. And uh, uh, there's some older issues, there's some new issues. Um, it was both parents and teachers. Um, but I'll tell you what, for those of you that do not know what the adult transitions program is, you need to take the time, look into that. It's phenomenal what they do those young people. Um, I would love to see it even be bigger. I had two kids I know from uh, my last year of driving a special needs bus that are both in the program now. It's 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 incredible program. Um, that's all I can say. Um, so um, very delighted to be there um, and very delighted to be a listener. The other one is I uh, learned on Sunday night that my granddaughter, who happens to be a student here in Wall Lake, was uh, tested positive for COVID-19. And it made me think again, I actually had already, if, for those of you that don't know, you can get free, for free, government provided um, testing kits um, that are uh, all processed by the USPS. Um, if, you, if you don't take advantage, I actually signed up for that on Friday when it happened. And I've already got my four in the mail as of yesterday. So, but COVID is there. It's just one of those things you just wanna bring to people's attention. Be considerate to your bus drivers be considerate to your classmates and be considerate to your teachers. You know, um, it, it's one of those things that's gonna be with us um, forever and ever and ever. So um, take advantage uh, of those free kits and uh, be considerate of everyone around you. If you do test positive and, uh, and uh, you, you uh, 
you follow a policy, our policy uh, goes back to t uh, August of 2022 here in the district. I don't know if we're gonna update that or have an update coming, but um, it just brings it home um, when somebody in your family member uh, tests positive. So I'll leave it at that. Um, thank you. Just a couple of things. Um, I couldn't agree more with uh, Mrs. Levin on the, the data to drive decisions. So when we had our, our session and talked about kind of where we want to go, um, I had mentioned that I had pursued that data specialty certificate. And also Mrs. Fernandez is taking some of those classes as well. And um, I think it is extremely important. And I, I thank um, you know, the board members who are doing that because I, it is good information. Learning, I think you nailed it, learning what questions to ask. And, you know, and, and Dr. Bernie is gonna to bring to us as he continues to uh, put together the data package for us, looking at many things. Um, I'm known sometimes to say we can't look at things as one note. And what I mean by that is that we have to look at different indicators. And then when we see something, we have to ask the question. It's, for example, it's great that we have 60% who are achieving. What are we doing for the other 40%? And are there any of those 60% uh, who are overachieving and we need to give them supports as well? And I know that our district is doing that. And, and when we ask that question, we can um, continue to understand how our kids are doing. It's not just about one set of numbers that we're looking at. So thank you for bringing up the fact that, that you're doing that. Um, Lakes Area Youth Assistance, I heard a number of 30,000 raised. So that wasn't said today um, by Ms. Van Leeuwen or by um, Mr. Siegler, but that's phenomenal um, for kids who are in need and families who need support. And the last thing, I wasn't sure I was gonna say anything, but I, I was traveling and we say things at the beginning of the school district about bus safety and being careful and watching out for kids. And I see that here in this district, whether I'm walking and in my neighborhood I see buses or whatnot. I was in another state, I'm not going to call out a state, but it wasn't the same. I had people who were beeping at me because they, didn't, they wanted me to go on by and rush by the bus. And I just, just kind of a reminder that it isn't just remember bus safety in September, it's remember bus safety throughout. And we care about um, our students and our bus drivers all the time. So I just wanted to end it with that, that I was proud that every time in our district, I see people who, who are caring about that. And we have some roundabouts uh, around here now, even more of them. And it's kind of hard sometimes to, to put a bus through a roundabout. So um, I appreciate everything that our, our drivers are doing. All right, with that, I'm gonna move on to the consent agenda. On the consent agenda tonight, we have the approval of minutes. From September 7th, there was a special meeting, closed session, and a regular meeting. We have personal recommendations. As uh, Mr. Russo mentioned, we have an administrative appointment. We also have new hires, resignations, and retirements. And we also have the Head Start Director's Report. Mrs. Levin. I move that the Board of Education approve the consent agenda as presented. Support. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries 6-0. Now we have a series of purchases. Do you want to just take the purchases and go down yeah, them one by one? Yeah, Okay, Dr. Bernia. We'll start with Mr. Chaffield. Thank, thank you, Dr. Bernia. Uh, a, a recommended best practice for school safety is having a means to quickly cover classroom windows and glass to prevent visibility inside the classroom. Uh, several systems were investigated and administration recommends the purchase of night lock safety shades, which can be quickly and easily deployed. Uh, night lock shades are available through the TIPS Purchasing Cooperative, which is where we recommend that we purchase them. Uh, the, this purchase uh, in the amount of $227,710.53 will be funded with proceeds from the Michigan School Safety Grant and a uh, separate bid recommendation for the installation of these shades will follow uh, momentarily. Mr. Siegler. I move that the Board of Education approve the purchase of district-wide security shades from Nightlock through the TIPS Purchasing Cooperative for $227,710.53 from the School Safety Security Grant Fund. Support. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries 6-0. 
We're going to move to Mrs. Kohansky. Thank you, Dr. Bernia. Next on the list is Edgenuity Online Courseware from Imagine Learning. It's an annual renewal in the amount of $95,790 from the general fund, and that courseware goes to support over 600 students who access online courses, either in person, in flex classes, in uh, seated classroom computer labs with teachers, or our Walt Lake virtual program, which allows students to access a virtual program in grades nine through 12, which is also overseen daily by our Walt Lake teachers, uh, as well as credit recovery courses that students take throughout the year and as well as in the summer. Uh, in cases where students in high school have failed graduate credit courses, they can easily retake those courses uh, to make up for that credit so that they graduate on time. <laughs> Mr. Siegler. <laughs> I move the Board of Education to approve this uh, pilot eliminate education annual renewal. Nope, nope, oh, nope. I move that the Board of Education approve the purchase of this. Ingenuity Online Courseware, Imagine Learning, and annual renewal of $95,790 from the general fund. Support? Any discussion? Mrs. Fernandez. So um, I uh, have just been looking at this, and I know we had some conversation amongst ourselves earlier about do we know, you know exactly what parts we're using it or how we're using it. I'm not sure that I have a particular um, issue with the content of this program, but I know that it did rise in popularity as COVID came up and there just weren't a lot of options, right, for, for this degree of online um, courses. And I know that we have, a, we have another one coming up after this, and we have already approved some other software type programs. And um, so I, um, while I don't have a particular issue with this one, I do believe that I would like to see us get a holistic look at the courseware that we're using in software and see where there's duplication and how much adoption is even being used. And I feel like, you know, we're out of the weeds with the online learning um, tragedy that everybody had to figure out. And, um, and so, uh, so that's, where I, um, that's where I stand on that. And I believe for that, I will probably vote no. Um, but I don't, um, you know, I, I just, I'd like to see us take a look at this. Mrs. Tice? Yeah, so, um, you know, especially in light of everything that kind of came up with the Lucy Calkins curriculum, um, just kind of coming to light some of the stuff that was in there with the teacher guides, um, kind of made me wonder, um, you know, what kind of things might be in this courseware um, that maybe we're not aware of. Um, so I kind of echo Mrs. Levin's concerns from earlier with the Lucy Calkins stuff that, um, you know, okay, so maybe some of our teachers, you know, do have the foresight to um, not use that particular portion of the guide, but that doesn't mean the subs coming in don't, and it doesn't mean that the new teachers that rely a little bit more on the guides don't. Um, and I think that as a district, if we are going to um, purchase a curriculum and use this curriculum, we're saying that this curriculum and what it contains is good for our district. Um, and so I just, I, I do have a problem um, with the content of that um, being pushed on our children. And I think that as a board, we have the responsibility to protect the hearts and the minds of these um, kids and to protect especially the innocence of these young ones. Um, and so I know I had reached out with some questions. Um, and one of the things too, I tried to look online a little bit. I saw that um, this software only has like a 2.5 rating. Um, and so, you know, it was kind of came back like we don't know all the content that's in there. Um, it's hard to research some of the content because you have to have login information for it. Um, so I just decided to actually call the Edgenuity um, people and just ask them, hey, can you tell me how you promote DEI and can you tell me about some of the stuff that is in this courseware? Um, and they did confirm that, um, you know, that the, um, you know, same ideologies are also um, in their courseware and he was going to send me some examples um, of that. 
But I also, you know, I feel like if we are saying that, you know, diversity, we have to include, you know, every child. Um, and so, you know, um, I feel like there's a lot of focus on, um, you know, certain children with certain beliefs, but we don't give other children with certain beliefs that same um, respect, if you will, um, um, the same um, even just exposure to tax, you know? So if we're gonna promote the LGBTQ ideology, then where are we promoting, you know, um, the people who, you know, um, want to hear about, you know, Jesus Christ or other things like that. Um, I, it was mentioned earlier in public comment, somebody said something and made reference to our constitution and how our constitution even starts out with, you know, the creator has endowed us with certain inalienable rights. Um, and, you know, um, our constitution acknowledges that there's a creator. Um, and I believe every life has been designed for our creator um, for a purpose and has value. Um, and I think that we um, operate best and are most prosperous and blessed when we live in light of what we were designed to do, how we were designed to live. Um, and so as we look back at history, um, we have a long history of prayer being in the schools. We have a long history of um, the Ten Commandments being on our walls. And um, I think there's been a direct correlation of the decline um, in academia when we have taken out that sense of morality. Um, Ms. Tice, I'm sorry to interrupt you. I just want to understand how you're correlating this to the curriculum. I'm getting a little confused. I'm trying to be respectful, but I'm getting a little confused. Okay, well, if you will follow, um, let me finish, I'll bring it around. Um, you know, certain people want to say that if you speak against their lifestyle, that that's hate speech. And I think we've heard that a lot of times, even in um, some of these board meetings. Um, but I can disagree with one's lifestyle and still be loving to them. Um, and so um, I'm just going to give you two examples. I think when we, um, when we truly love and care about somebody, we're going to speak the truth to them. And so, um, you know, I had a high school friend who was, um, I found out my senior year she was involved in drugs. And um, I was too scared to confront it with her because I was afraid of what she might say or the dissolving of our friendship. Um, and so I didn't care enough about her. I didn't love her enough to, to speak what I believed the truth was um, to her. Um, and so um, as a board member, um, you know, I want to do the same. I want to care enough about the kids in this district to speak the truth in love. And I don't think that it's loving when we push these sexualized agendas on our kids. Um, like we saw in the, you know, um, the potential even for that, right, that we see um, in the guides, the curriculum guides. Um, and so just even, you know, that content appearing um, in this courseware, um, it would violate my conscience to vote on something that contains that because I don't believe that exposing kids to that is in their best interest. And because I love the people, whether people see that as love or not, I can't vote on that. Did you want to say something, Mrs. Levin? Yep, I'll keep it brief. Um, you know, in, in light of my comments during the board commentary, I think that reviewing all the curriculum is, is something that, that we have to do as board members. I'm not voting no on this curriculum, so no worries there. Um, but one thing I do want to dive in, you know, one thing I've learned as a new board member is we kind of go through a cycle. We got to hit everything one time. We got to see everything one time before we can really dive in the next year. So 
what I'm hoping is that between now and next time we have to vote on a renewal that, that um, you know, I'll know more data questions to ask, <laughs> to, um, you know, to understand more about what's the usage of this software, what are the outcomes, are students achieving on this software, or are we just using the software type of thing? So, um, you know, of course, I want to know the content, but I think you said there's like 927 courses. That's never going to happen, but maybe there's something we can use or do or something we can look at to just understand what are we signing up for? What are the other options? If this is the option, what, are, you know, what's what's it accomplishing? So, just want to understand that more. Not going to hold up a vote tonight, but just wanted to throw that out there. Okay. Did you want to say something, Mr. Peterson? Yes. Um, wasn't going to say anything, but I will. Um, first of all, as Ms. Dr. Bernia knows, I sent him a note the other day, um, requesting a little bit more information in a broader sense of. Now we're seeing some of these renewals in various activities. Some could be administrative, teacher administrative uh, softwares, things of that nature. We did not see these up until a couple months ago. So even for us that have been on the board, it's a little bit of a new experience. So I did ask Dr. Bernie, and I told him it was not a hurry, um, that we go back and try to get an understanding of all these different softwares that we have. <laughs> under license in some form, how do we analyze those and how do we make a decision in some cases be book versus electronic? Um, so I think we need to do a little bit of higher overview at times, um, get a better understanding. And, and I, I think I wanna ask uh, Ms. Kohansky if she could please reiterate what's the process normally when you guys look at the, even though this is a renewal, what's your process? Well, I've been through this before, but there may be a few board members that have not heard this before. Yeah, absolutely, thank you. I know there was a question asked about this at Genuity Courseware. When was it reviewed? When was it adopted? How long has it been here? Uh, Edgenuity's been used in the district for well more than 15 years, so it predates me. Um, and unfortunately, then I can't speak to the process that was used at the time for looking at that, evaluating that. I would probably make an educated guess that 15 years ago there wasn't a whole lot of options in online courseware out there for students. And at the time, I believe that the educators that were in this district and making those kinds of decisions were looking at the needs of students, right? So we always look at student need. And when you have kids that, let's say for instance in the example of credit recovery, right? We have students that are taking in-person classes at the high school level who, let's say they fail Algebra 2, and Algebra 2 is a requirement for graduation. Um, and let's say they're, they're a senior, they fail it in their senior year. Uh, that's gonna prevent them from graduating and getting that diploma that they need. So in place of that, they can't take another Algebra II class with an in-person teacher during that time, right, during that year. But what we can do is we can offer them the opportunity to have access to an online course, which they can take, complete, it's accredited, and then they can go ahead and get that credit that they need and, and obtain their, their diploma and graduate. So I believe that early on, those student needs are what drove a lot of the decision making in terms of selection. Um, now as far as a review process for online courseware, uh, I can't speak to that because I've not purchased strictly online courseware for students. Um, I think one of the things that I responded to in some board questions that came up this week was, how do you make a decision whether you choose something electronically or choose something that's hard copy? And really, oftentimes in learning services, our hands are a bit tied with that. It really depends on the vendor. Okay. So let's say, for instance, we're looking at um, a math program in middle school. I'm making a hypothetical. We're looking at a math program in middle school, and it's just a renewal for us to, to get the new edition because the new edition's come out. Board has previously reviewed it and approved it, but this is a new edition. Now the vendor says, well, you can only get this, or you can only get some online resources um, instead of a, a, a hard copy workbook, let's say. That's not our choice to say, well, we really want the hard copy workbook when the vendor says, we don't make those anymore. And I have a feeling that a lot of the vendors that are out there are being driven by, I'm sure there's financial uh, gain for them to sell you online courseware versus hard copy courseware. You think about the printing, the cost of manufacturing of that and shipping of that when they can charge you the same if not more for an online version of that, right? So I think there's a lot of layers and complexity to that, but I agree with you, Mr. Peterson, this change in process for us has now brought some of these things in front of us to talk about and take a look at. 
Um, one of the things that I'm working on with the business office right now is a comprehensive list of what we typically do and, and renew um, and talking more at length about what some of those processes look like and, and certainly open to hearing feedback and questions from folks about you know, what do we do with this, how did we get there, what decisions were made around that, and, and certainly I'm open to, to having more conversation this year about that. Yeah, uh, is there somebody who wants you want to say something else? Yeah, I'm sorry, did you want to say something else, Mrs. Fernandez? Sure. Yeah, I just wanted just to make it clear that I don't, um, I don't have any foundation for, um, for thinking about this from what the course content is, right? But what I've seen from this particular software, and it's probably because it's been around for a very long time, is you know that there's some technical challenges with it, that the student support model is not robust enough, and that, that you know there, there's a flooding of um, you know not enough folks able to support the the population of students and folks that are accessing it and needing help, and um, and there's one more, but I can't even see what it, the heck it was because I did think of oh the the question and answer format. Just the way that it's uh, it goes about it, it makes it so you know, like if you don't get it the first time, it's much easier than maybe more modern curriculum to just guess your way through it the second time or the third round. So there's really, I think, those are the types of things that I'm sure we'll get into and we'll be looking at as we start to think about those renewals. And th those are the those are the items that I, you know, I'm hopeful that we'll be able to take a look at as we get into that. And I yeah, know you absolutely. Will. So yeah, thank, thank you. you for that. Yeah. So Mrs. Fernandez, I would ask maybe. Um, like one of the things I think of, there's a couple things I think about when I, when I look at this purchase. So one, we used to have a program, um, we used to have a high school, community high. And community high was a program that was pretty expensive, but it was uh, pretty effective. And um, those kids, many of them were there for you know, credit recovery. And they could do the things in person. We don't have that anymore. We don't have the supports there. We've tried to do it a couple of different ways. Um, I look at it where when something isn't maybe exactly perfect, maybe we will get a holistic look. Um, I, I worry that voting no on something like this, you have 600 students-ish who are using this, that what are they going to do in the meantime? So can we support the superintendent and his staff and pass this knowing that they are going to give us more information and we're gonna holistically look at everything. So I'd like you to maybe just think about that before you vote no. That's fair and honestly my, uh, just stating that I am thinking of voting no is knowing full well that I expect it will pass and, and it's really just making it very clear that I, I don't wanna keep voting yes on renewals and things over and over again. This came up before when we renewed other packages and we haven't done anything differently. And so I feel like, what can I do, you know, what can I do differently to make it clear that, um, that I really think it's important. We're gonna vote on $150,000 plus worth of these types of things. And I don't wanna see, you know, months and months go by and every new renewal is just, to, you know, like, well, let's just put this one through. That's and again, I just flip it. I just say, what about those 600 students who are depending on this right now and don't have anything else right now? That's all I'm asking you. Yeah. Again, you're gonna vote how you wanna vote, but I want you to just think about that before we take the vote. Yes, Ms. Tice. So, um, you know, I do think that that is a valid point, right? And I don't think anybody wants to hold up, you know, 600 students. I think at the same time, you know, we just want to know, or I, I'll speak for myself, I, you know, just would like to know that um, we're also protecting the thousands of students that we have in the district from um, just being a, a sexual agenda being pushed on them. I just don't see it the same way. We have to agree to disagree on that one. Okay. Yeah. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Nay. Motion passes 5-1. The name was for Ms. Tice. We are gonna go right back to Mrs. Kohansky. Yes, thank you, Dr. Bernia. Next on the agenda is the EduClimber through Illuminate Education Annual Renewal of $66,802.95 from the general fund. And just a little bit about the EduClimber platform. Uh, that is something that grew out of our MTSS committee work that started four years ago when I entered the district. There was not an MTSS process that was systemic in place to help support students. Uh, and in looking at what systems we were going to develop and put in place to help students, those at the, those who at the struggling end and those at the top end that need more enrichment and more growth, um, one of the things that we noticed was we have a lot of data to look at when we talk about kids. So what does your attendance look like? What do your grades look like? 
Um, do you have any behaviors? Have you been suspended? Um, you know, what does your test data look like? And we heard a lot about iReady being one point of that, right? So what is your iReady data showing us? What are your um, benchmark assessments that you're taking in your in certain courses look like? Um, what does your MSTEP or state assessment data look like? And so what we found in that committee is that in order to get a good picture of what a student's profile looked like so that we could kind of make smart decisions about what we're seeing. You know, we heard about an eighth grade student that was clicking through iReady kind of willy-nilly because of, you know, <coughs> some test apathy and not really caring about that test. Well, other data points would point to the fact that that student's not reading below grade level, right? We would look at grades, we would look at other anecdotal notes, we would look at other benchmark assessments, state assessments, things such as that. Mm -hmm. So what EduClimber does is it allows us to look at all of that data in one place. So it's more about expediting processes for, for talking about students and supporting them in ways that, that we know they need. Um, and that's what this platform does, is it's, it's used by our staff and our administration in order for making sound decisions about what kids need. Um, and so that's what this is. It's not used by students. It's not an interface or a software curriculum. It's just a data warehouse so that it can communicate with all those other systems and then we just can get all of that in one spot. Mr. Siegler. Again, I move that the Board of Education approve the purchase of EduClimber Illuminate Education Annual Renewal for $66,802.95 from the general fund. Any discussion? Mrs. Fernandez. I have just the similar comment, and I know you, you're, you're dutiful and hear me um, in that area. Um, I, I'm sure that it's useful. I, um, as a, um, in my professional career, I can't help but wonder, is there duplication of this versus like the critical incident tracking and some, are there areas if we were to look at the whole portfolio of softwares and things, we might, you know, we might be able to, um, to have some thoughts about rationalization and, and how it all looks at a, as a whole. But same comment as before, nothing new though. May I go ahead and make a comment about yes, that? Please. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for that. Um, and actually, that's that's what we found is we didn't have a software platform. That there there isn't a duplication. There's lots of buckets um, of data and and different ways that we collect that, whether it be through Skyward, through Illuminate, iReady has their own thing. The state has its own um, place where all of that student data is housed. And what this does is it kind of pulls it all from all those little individual buckets into one. So right now, and I'm happy to share that when we get that bigger overview of what our software renewals look like, we don't have anything currently that's duplicating that. This is kind of a standalone, one-off thing. Thank you. Yeah, and I would just say, as soon as you started talking that, I, I wrote down data lake. So it, part of my day job, I'm working on putting a data lake together right now. Um, so it, it is, I think, I applaud the district for having a data analyst who, who does that, right? Pulling in that information because when you pull reports from separate places and then try to bring it together from different software and you don't have something like this, it's really inefficient. Um, so I actually, I applaud you for, for having something like this and I do support this. Um, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries 6-0. And we're on to bid award. Mr. Chatfield. Thank you, Dr. Bernia. Uh, the installation of the security shades um, was not part of the bid uh, for the purchase of them earlier. Um, we, so we did solicit bids for the installation of these shades. We received five bids and recommend uh, awarding the installation of the security shades to Nightlock uh, based on their low bid of $39,535. Uh, Nightlock, of course, is the provider of the security shades that uh, were just approved. Uh, and they have successfully completed many installations throughout the state. And this, the installation of these shades will also be funded uh, from the Michigan School Safety and Security Grant. Ms. Rice. Um, I move that the Board of Education approve the bid award for the district-wide security shade installation provided by Nightlock from the School Safety Grant. Support. Any discussion? Mrs. Levin. Just a question I thought of, sorry for not asking sooner. Um, assuming this passes, since the purchase passed, when would these be installed? Uh, it, it will take several months to get all the materials. There are several thousand different shades, sizes. It's have, they have to go on all the various size of windows. Uh, and once they arrive, uh, they will begin installing. I would say it would be after the first of the year, and this work will be done after school hours. Okay, thank you. 
All right, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries 6-0. District annual report, Dr. Bernia. Yes, uh, we are, the, the district is required to publish an annual report, but ours goes far above and beyond the requirements. So <laughs> I do want to thank Mr. Durkin and our community relations team for their hard work. It is outside on the table. Uh, board members were provided this. It gives a nice highlight of several things that happened in and around the district over the 22-23 school year, uh, including your decision to hire a new superintendent. So I uh, appreciate that very much. Okay. The proclamation, Michigan Safe Schools Week, October 15th through 21, 2023. Dr. Bernier. Yes. Uh, whereas schools make a substantial contribution to the future of America and to the development of our young people as knowledgeable, responsible, and productive citizens, and whereas excellence in education is dependent on safe, secure, and peaceful school settings, and whereas the safety and well-being of many students, teachers, and school staff are unnecessarily jeopardized by crime and violence, such as substance abuse, gangs, bullying, poor discipline, vandalism, and absenteeism in our schools, and whereas it is the responsibility of all citizens to enhance the learning experience of young people by helping to ensure fair and effective discipline, promote good citizenship, and generally make schools safe and secure. And whereas all leaders, especially those in education, law enforcement, government, and business should eagerly collaborate with each other to focus public attention on school safety and identify, develop, and promote innovative answers to these critical issues. And whereas numerous schools and school districts throughout Michigan, along with national programs, are among those innovative answers, and whereas the observance of Michigan Safe Schools Week will substantially promote efforts to provide our schools with positive and safe learning climates, now therefore be it resolved and proclaim that October 15th through 21st is Michigan Safe Schools Week. All right, and you have another proclamation. I do, I Principal's do. Principal's Muffle. Yes, one of our school resource officers is in the room, uh, so I do want to thank Officer Giffen, who's right back there. Uh, she works at Wall Lake Northern uh, and, and works with our, our two other resource officers who are stationed at Central and Western, and I want to thank our law enforcement partners uh, also. They, they get, we get together with them uh, a couple times a year from all the various municipalities, and, and I'm very grateful for their support. So now we will move on to the proclamation for Principals Month, which reads, Whereas throughout Michigan and across the country, the school principal plays a central role in creating an environment conducive to learning, and whereas the State Board of Education acknowledges the challenge of 21st century teaching, leading, and learning, and whereas the school principal acts as the liaison between the school and the community it serves and ensures that parents and taxpayers are aware of student achievement, and whereas the expectations for principal leadership within schools have increased greatly in the past decade, including quality and accountability for all children. And whereas energetic and, expiring and inspiring school leadership is essential if schools, teachers, students, and support staff are to implement college and career ready standards and rigorous assessments. And whereas the goal of Michigan School Principals Month is to raise awareness of the importance of educational leadership in the school and valuable contribution of the school principal to the success of the learning community. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Walt Lake Schools Board of Education <laughs> and Administration support Michigan Schools Principals Month and encourage each school and community to appropriately recognize their principal during the month of October 2023 and the vital role the principal plays in the success of all students. Thank you. And I noticed we're doing some social media highlights of our principals. That's great. Yes, indeed. All right, our next to last item before adjournment is our board policy committee update. And I'm not gonna steal any thunder from Mrs. Fernandez, but what I will do, just for those who may not be aware, we did um, decide to form a policy committee. We've had a policy committee before. Uh, we feel that that is an effective way because there's just a lot of work and a lot of discussion that needs to take place with policies. All of it will come back to here to us at the board. Um, but um, thankfully, uh, Mr. Peterson, Mrs. Fernandez, and Mrs. Kaplan have agreed to do that work with Dr. Bernie and his staff. So Mrs. Fernandez, I'll hand it off to you for Great. an update. Thank you. I just wanted to share some highlights as we um, had our first uh, get together to kind of figure out what our approach was be, would be and how we would move it along. Um, if you've been following our board meetings, you'd know that earlier meetings, we've had some policy updates. And so we've gotten through a first reading and shared there are about 14 or so policy updates that were recommended that we start with. And um, we voted in June to kind of defer some of that specifically to a later date uh, as Dr. Bernia and staff were furiously getting ad administrative regulations in place and, and some other foundational things. So 
Um, so with respect to the approach that we, uh, that we agreed we would like to bring forward and, and share here, um, uh, we want to first address those updates that we'd already started with along with six new items that are on the fall list from Miller Johnson. Uh, so that would make about a total of 20 uh, specific policies that we've been recommended to update. So that feels like a good start, along with the code of ethics language that um, we've been talking about, which is in section 1001. And so that little bundle of items feels like a good, quick first, first hit. So that's, um, so that's where, we, uh, where we agreed to start. Um, we then also had some conversation about which policies should be reviewed, and uh, at least in the committee, our uh, recommendation is that all policies be reviewed. Um, and uh, we talked about a pecking order, if there should be a pecking order, and in fact wanted to um, give ourselves the flexibility or suggest that we would have the flexibility to not go in straight numerical order or things like the IT security policy at the very end would might take a really long time to get to, and it might be more important that we pull that one forward, for example. And so, uh, as a committee, we'll work to identify some other bundles and make sure that we're sharing them ahead of time uh, for your uh, input, uh, and, then, uh, and then start the process. Um, we talked about a cadence or flow to make sure that all of the stakeholders are appropriately involved. That starts with the superintendent and staff. Um, and then uh, comes to the committee and then goes to legal and then comes to the board for first reading and uh, questions will go back and forth and then a second reading. So all of that is very uh, much aligned with what we do uh, normally anyways, but um, it felt good to just confirm that we were all in, in alignment on how we, that would flow. Um, and then we did say, you know, that we would like to uh, in addition to looking at the policies, which might take us quite some time, there's more than 170 of them, to also make sure that we're aligning on the mechanics of future updates. So whether that's um, future updates, requests for new policies, you know, consideration for, you know, Miller Johnson, Neola has been raised, and some folks have asked some questions about, you know, who do we keep using. Um, all of that is, uh, feels like something that we would also like to align on after we get a lot of work under our belt on the um, committees. So, I think we've got a date now for our next meeting. Is that right, Mr. Peterson? It was like the 17th, maybe? You said? Yeah, so um, we've set a, a next meeting date, and we're thinking that our hit list or our quick wins list, we'd like to be able to work uh, together with the board on, um, bring uh, forward as soon as maybe the November 2nd board meeting for the first reading, and then uh, target September or December 7th meeting for our second reading. So we want to we want to get a quick start, and then kind of get a cadence going. Perfect. It sounds like you had a lot of uh, good conversation. It was great conversation, yeah, and I really appreciate um, Mr. Peterson and Ms. Kaplan and Dr. Bernia and Lisa who helped us as well. So okay. I think we're ready to, we're ready and excited to roll. All right. Well, thank you. Appreciate that. And at 9.59, not 10, we are adjourning. <laughs>